We spoke with the cast of a very buzzy show. It's taken over TikTok. It's called The Summer I Turned Pretty. And the young and talented cast gave us the full scoop. And calling all Stranger Things fans. No spoilers, don't worry. But Sadie Sinks, who plays Max on Stranger Things, was in our building. And of course, we had to ask her everything that she could tell us about this fourth volume of the show. So we'll show you that. And later, we're continuing our love for the one and only Harrison Ford. We're going to go back to the 80s for his 80th, a flashback to his Raiders of the Lost Ark days. That is still all to come, but first, here are today's pop star headlines. <laughs> Prince Harry, the Duke of Sussex, who also happens to be the chief impact officer of the Better Up Company, is out with a new project called Transform with Mental Fitness. The film is created to drive awareness on how a mental fitness practice can be beneficial regardless of background or even profession. We've got an exclusive first look here in the clip. You'll see Prince Harry sitting down with record-setting Olympian Chloe Kim to chat about a pro proactive approach to mental health. How would you describe the relationship between the mind and the body when it comes to operating at peak performance? It would be unrealistic for me to expect to go out there and, you know, land an amazing run, learn a new trick if I wasn't feeling good mm. mentally. And um, I can't expect myself to perform at mm -hmm. my peak when I am doubting myself and mm. I'm feeling negative emotions. If I'm not feeling good mentally, then it will jeopardize my physical health. Mm. And they go hand in hand. And so Love to see those conversations mm -hmm. happen. You can check out more of that when you head over yeah. to today.com. All right, next up, Leah Michelle. Don't rain on her parade. The actress just landed the role of Fanny Bryce in Broadway's Funny Girl, and it's a part of 13 years in the making for her. We remember her take on Barbara Streisand's iconic character during her time in Glee, and of course, this number from the show's very first season. I am the target and wham! One shot, one gunshot, yeah. and bam! Hey, Mr. Onstein! That's Savannah's favorite TV moment of all time. Oh, wow. So oh, wow. So oh, everyone should it. watch that today. That's awesome. They should do a duet. Can we do that? I, I well, would watch that. I can't sing, but it's, it's so awesome. That's an awesome thing. That's yeah. awesome. Well, the casting news comes just one day after current Fanny Bryce, Beanie Feldstein, uh, announced that she would be departing from the show at the end of July earlier than originally planned. Feldstein writing online that she had made the decision to leave the production. That decided uh, to go in, quote, a different direction. As for the rest of the Funny Girl cast, there aren't any plans for a Glee reunion that we know of on stage. Michelle's former co-star Jane Lynch is set to wrap up her run as Miss Bryce uh, before the, she mm -hmm. joins the cast in September. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay. I should wait. Interesting. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I guess she was Mrs. Yeah, she was Bryce. Mrs. Yes, Bryce. Mrs. Yeah. Bryce. Yeah. But then Leah Michelle's mm -hmm. coming. Will be in, yes. Okay. When Got it. It's available. Yeah. Next up, Tim McGraw, even though he's been busy lately starring alongside Faith Hill in the Yellowstone prequel series, which is great, 1883, he's still finding some time to do new music. Tim told Country Music Countdown's Lon Helton he's already laid down eight new songs. McGraw teasing his upcoming music, saying, I'm always looking to beat what I did last time. I'm sure we're going to have something off the new album here hopefully before too long but when that actually might be McGraw's not giving us any details summer concert yeah we need him Tim here McGraw. we need Tim McGraw on, Tim. here That'd be we just need yes. to debut some of that new music right on the yeah. that's right you can yeah. sit here on the couch yeah. we can play I'm, on the couch we can show him how to do it with the pillows with the pillow don't that's you right. feel better the pillow feels Everybody's better right. he can have the couch he can take it with him yeah. next up Simone Biles even after taking home Olympic gold world championship medals and a presidential medal of freedom it turns out that Simone's still able to blend in with a crowd Biles recently released Releasing this picture to her Instagram story, captioning the post, not the flight attendant trying to give me a coloring book when I board. Let's put that picture up. I said, no, I'm good. I'm 25. That's right. <laughs> Team USA superstar Simone Biles was mistaken for a child <laughs> on that flight. Do you not have the picture? Oh, we might. Uh, and now this screen grab is going viral. <laughs> Folks on Twitter showing support by sharing their stories of being mistaken for a kid <laughs> because of their height. One 36-year-old writing, checking in at five feet tall. Within the last couple of years, I was offered the children's menu and crayons <laughs> when I was out to dinner with my now wife and friend wow. and a friend. Uh, there you go. Great things. Oh, funny. Kind of. That was funny. Yeah. And that's the latest you need to know from today. Still coming up, we've got the buzz on a new show that everybody seems to be talking about. It's called The Summer I Turned Pretty. Stay tuned. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. 
Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Allie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to Popstar Plus. If you are looking for a show that's full of romantic beach vibes, look no further than The Summer I Turn Pretty. We've had this one on our Swifty radar because the trailer features Taylor's version of her 2014 track, This Love. So the new show is about a summer love triangle, and it's from creator and executive producer Jenny Han. Han and the young cast spoke to us about why the show and the books that they're based on resonate with so many people. Take a look. My family spends every summer in Cousins Beach with my mom's best friend and her two sons, Conrad and Jeremiah. The Summer I Turn Pretty is about uh, a girl's coming of age. It's about her having one magical summer where a lot of dreams come true and also don't come true. <laughs> but this summer... See you guys later. It's different. Damn. You look hot. Stop flirting with my sister. I play Belly. She is a 15, almost 16 year old girl who is entering sort of this new chapter of her life. I felt that I could relate to her a lot um, being, you know, a teenager myself and being 16 not too long ago and uh, still sort of being in that period of, of so much change and, and um, really still figuring out like who I am and, and what my, my path looks like. So I, I really love being able to bring that to life um, in her shoes. Susanna told me she knew I was destined for one of her boys. I always hoped it would be Conrad, but then there was Jeremiah. You're my best friend. The love triangle is, I mean, it's really special. She has this incredible connection that is so different with these two boys, um, and they're such important parts of her life. She has such different love for each of them, but I think that was a lot of fun to explore and to sort of, um, you know, figure out with Chris, who plays Conrad, and Gavin, who plays Jeremiah, and then with Jenny, too, because, um, you know, she's the, one, she's the one who wrote it, so everyone will have, will have their own, you know, opinion about who, who they uh, favor, but I think um, when it comes down to it, it's, it's all Belly's decision and what she truly feels in her heart. What's special about the love triangle is that it's messy is that it's young, it's, it's passionate, and when things happen quickly, it, it leaves a lot of room for people to make mistakes, and a lot of room for people to try and cover up their mistakes with more mistakes, and, <laughs> and just the snowball effect of things happening and the way that things affect each other and other people outside of the love triangle, you know, and how the rest of the world affects them. And I think my favorite part of playing Conrad was just trying to figure him out because he's sort of an enigma. And it really, I had a long time before, from when I got cast to when we started filming. So, and it took me the whole time to really love him, which I do. Um, but to be able to just find his ins and out, what makes him tick, why he's so mean sometimes. It was, it was fun as an actor, really fun. Jeremiah is so special to me because he is that life of the party. He is that golden retriever and he really does try to care for everyone that's in his life. And I think sometimes that's at his own peril and I think that uh, his insecurities and his lack of confidence and trying to find out who he is in, in life and in all of his relationships, uh, I think with so much 
like fun and it was just so special to explore that on film. I play Steven, uh, 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 a handsome yet vain <laughs> high achiever. He's real snarky and he's an older brother with a lot of love. I think that's like, that's a big defining characteristic. He leaves with his heart. Um, and that's probably my favorite part of playing him. That no matter what the situation is, uh, it always comes from here. Yeah, we spent an absurd amount of time together. Mm -hmm. Sean and I lived across the street from each other, and we would just drive each other to work to spend more time <laughs> with yeah. each other. Like yeah. to a point where like we each got stuck at set a few times with no way home because the other person got cut early that day. <laughs> and <laughs> but it was worth it because then we got to spend more time together. Yeah. You know? Always worth it. Boys might come and go, but a best friend is once in a lifetime. I think that The Summer I Turned Pretty really celebrates um, friendship between two women and um, how, you know, you actively make the choice um, to, to choose each other again and again. With Laurel and Susanna in this beach house and the world that they've created um, for themselves and, and for their kids, it's a choice that they make because they go back there every summer and um, they are each other's like person. And then we get to see some friendship on the um, teen side um, with Belly and Taylor. And as you grow up, I think you realize in many ways you're very different people. And you think, if I met this person now, we might not be friends, but there is some connection between the two of you where you will always really value and treasure that person because they've known you um, before you were you. And um, I think, so it's like sort of different, different aspects of friendship. Cousins is inspired by a lot of different beaches. I would say Cape Cod um, is probably the main one in my head um, because I was spending a lot of time um, in Cape Cod when I was writing the books, but I also spent time on Martha's Vineyard and the Hamptons and um, uh, the Nags Head, which is in North Carolina. Um, so I think I borrowed something from all of those beaches and I think it's why uh, these books have really um, resonated with people like um, all over because everybody has like a beach um, where they're from or that they've been to as a kid. So people like in Sweden or um, in Vietnam, you know, can kind of imagine their own beach. There's something in the show for everyone. I think that there's a relationship between the parents, between the guys, between the girls, uh, the guys and girls. And I think like it, there's so much uh, to explore for everybody. Well, guess what? You're in luck. We've got more with the show's rising star, Lola Tung. She spoke to Hoda and Michelle Collins about taking on her first series role. Everywhere I turn, people are talking about the hit Prime video show, The Summer I Turned Pretty. We cannot wait to catch up with its breakout star, Lola Tung. Okay, Lola plays Isabel, a teenager navigating a drama-filled summer with childhood crushes, beach bonfires, and the occasional dip in the pool. Take a look. One, two, three! <laughs> How's the water? <laughs> Guys, I hurt my ankle. Come on. Yes. Gotcha. Yes. Good to go, girl. Lola, hi. hi! We should point out, before we get started, this is your very first acting role, and is this your very first television appearance? It is, yes. Wait, what? Wow. Very excited to be here. How do you feel in this uh, moment that oh you're in? Oh my gosh, I'm so excited, I'm thrilled. How I'm happy are you that I'm here? It's yes. <laughs> really the question. You must be over so the moon, excited. that's great. Well, Lola, we're so excited for you. So, every now and then, like, a moment happens in your life. You're busy going to college, doing your thing. <laughs> And all of a sudden, in a minute, your life changes. What happened? Yeah, I mean, I was uh, in my second semester of my first year of college at, at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. And um, I had just started working with my manager. And she sent me this audition and was like, I think, you know, you'd be really right for it. And I uh, sent in tapes, but I, you know, was very focused on school and my what education. I was studying acting. Acting, so, uh, OK. OK, good. Know. Good. But um, yeah, I was, I was very focused on school. and. Um, I sent in these tapes and then I heard that they wanted me to test for the role and to read for the role and I was like, oh my God, this could, you know, really 
be something Change possibly. Change your life, yeah. I feel. Yeah. How jealous were your freshman classmates that you got on Amazon show? I have to imagine they were furious. <laughs> no, I mean, everyone was so supportive and so wonderful. Yeah. I watched teacher. the show. Yeah, it's, tell me. I have to say, it made me feel young. <laughs> I, I felt like I was in camp, like it was like high school summer. I mean, how, I want to yeah. ask, shooting it. Yeah. Had to do like feel us when shooting it as it felt to watch it yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely and everyone in the cast is amazing and wonderful and we we had the best time on and off set oh. well by the way it's two hunky guys are fighting over you <laughs> that's kind of a cool role to be in yeah uh, you know. <laughs> tell me about that part yeah i mean both chris who plays conrad and um gavin who plays jeremiah are wonderful people and um so easy to work with and and so much fun to just be around so i i feel very lucky that you know, we had such a wonderful friendship, and um, it worked out great. And you think, yes. and you think everyone would want to date on the show after? <laughs> well, that's the thing. <laughs> no, that I mean, be really fun, <laughs> yeah, right? Well, sometimes it can get, you know. But you know, yeah, that's we're, what I want to know about. <laughs> See, that's why you're so good. <laughs> what happened backstage, like behind the scenes? We all just hung out together, and really? we really, like, I made some incredibly close friends who wow. I think I'll be that's close nice. with that's for really a really long cool. time. I was just imagining what your folks might say, your, or think. Your mom is here. She's actually in the building. She's downstairs. What does she think of this turn of events? And were they all for you? leaving college and taking this role. Yeah, both of my parents and, and really my whole family have, has just been so supportive yeah. throughout the entire thing. Yeah. And they know that I, I love it and that I'm passionate about, you know, acting and about the show. And so they were incredibly supportive. And By the way, this show, which I've never heard of this happening, got a second season pickup before it even aired. <laughs> How was that possible? I mean, I don't get it. You know, I'm Jenny like, Han's incredible, yeah. you know, writer, showrunner, uh, Creator, she's she's amazing, and uh, so you're in acting school, and you're learning all the things that actors need to know, and then you get tapped in the middle of acting school to actually go act. You have to memorize the lines, mm -hmm. and I don't know. Do you have a photographic memory? How do you Ooh, no. how do you remember lines? <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's just a matter of, of running through them, and we'd usually get new sides, or I mean, you know, sides every morning, and. Mm -hmm. uh, you kind of work on those in the morning. Do you have a technique that you use? I feel like not really. Nothing's. But oh, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I do like to juggle to help Here me we memorize. Go. Okay, oh so tell goodness. me how that works in your brain. So you are juggling and. I don't know if it's just like the repetition of it that mm. sort of helps so it. Show me how you, how you do it. Oh, gosh. Okay. That's okay. Oh, now I'm nervous. No, 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 no there's no pressure. Okay, this is amazing. You're very, very you're good. You're very I good. I can't believe the lights. <laughs> no, but you're yeah. Very, so you're thinking of the lines as you're doing yeah, it? Yeah, usually How I'm you... kind of just in my trailer, just going over the lines, and I don't know, maybe it's just kind of... Do people watch you when you do it, or are you like private? Not usually. It's yeah, kind of just... private. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm excited. so excited. By yeah. the way, this is such a fun moment in your career, and we feel so lucky that we got to have your oh, very yeah. first television so, interview. Thank you so much. Well, we're so proud of you. It's Congratulations. on it. Very likable. You know you watch or you like her. <laughs> Well, that was cool. We appreciate hearing from Lola. We should mention the, re the Summer I Turned Pretty is available on Prime Video. All right, speaking of buzzy shows, Stranger Things star Sadie Sink brings us into the Upside Down. Next. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it.
Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. It's a can't miss summer on today. Ah! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. And welcome back to Pop Star Plus. Sadie Sink has returned as Max Mayfield in the hit show Stranger Things, and she gave Hoda and Justin Sylvester a recap on what it was like to bring these dark episodes to life. As soon as the final two episodes of Stranger Things season four dropped, Netflix crashed and caused a whole bunch of havoc for diehard yes. fans. I had to call in a favor to watch it. And this just in, the latest season of the hit series just hit a major milestone, topping one billion hours of viewing. Okay, well, front and center is this season is Max. It's played by the very talented Sadie Sink. Max is being targeted by the evil Thank you. Oh, yeah. So she has to come up with a plan to keep up from taking over her mind. Let's take a look. I just need to push him away, find a happy memory, and hide there. Hide in the light. You got a memory in mind? Yeah. It was a time when I was... I mean, okay, first of all, Sadie, hi. hi. Secondly, <laughs> Justin's mad at you because he missed part of his vacation in Mexico because he yes. was watching your show. I'm sorry. Watching your I show. I'm sorry before, I'm still sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> but you were shocked because you didn't know about the billion views. No, I just found out this morning that Netflix crashed apparently yeah, it crashed. no one like, told me that's yes. it's wild now what i love about you is not only are you a star of the show but you are like an avid viewer of the show you enjoy it just like the rest yeah because i mean i watched my character didn't come on until season two so i watched season one in like a day and was a huge fan uh, so even though i know what happens in the show i still watch it i'm like so excited to watch it every year it's so crazy because there's a lot of emmy buzz around this show but Winona Ryder yes. has been praising your acting <laughs> skills. You? She called you a young Meryl Streep. <laughs> we hate to Which say I, it, but come I, on. Yeah. Gotta say I, it. No, I, I, that's, that's too big of a comparison to make, I think. But I, I mean, Winona's incredible, and she's so amazing to work with and to have as kind of like a role model for us kids. So to hear her like, supporting us in the show in that way, that means a lot. Oh my, how old are you? I'm 20. Like you are. I had to think about it. I'm, I'm you know 20. What I love? You come from a family of how many How many siblings do you have? I'm one of five one kids. One of five. Yeah. And another one of your siblings is an actor as yes. well. What, does your, what do your parents think or when they mm -hmm. watch you? Yeah. What is that like for them to see you blossom? I mean, it was always me and my brother Mitchell. Like, we were, we were just kind of like the weird kids who would, like, make our family, like, you know, sit down and watch our, like, 10-minute-long productions that we'd, like, <laughs> yeah. choreograph and direct together. Um, but then it actually, I think we just took it a little too far or something. <laughs> but, like, our parents um, are incredibly supportive, our whole family, really. And I think it, you know, me going through it with my brother yeah. really helped. Yeah. It was because yeah. it was like the two of us, the together. Two of us together. For sure. So, yeah. But how do you guys, because I know a lot of siblings who are in the entertainment business, yeah. they get a little competitive. <laughs> like, and they get a little jealous. How do you guys just yeah. stay grounded and, yeah. and, and stay in that team mentality? It, I don't think, there's never been any uh, competitiveness between us at all. Mm -hmm. We're very supportive of each other. Um, so yeah, he's, you know, he's my best friend in the world, so. Aww. Aww. Yeah. Okay, can we talk about Taylor Swift? Yes. Okay, you adore her. Mm -hmm. She chose you to be in her video. That's incredible. How did Crazy. you, how did mm -hmm. you get the phone call and tell us about that moment? Well, I just, I, I didn't think it was real at first. Um, I guess she was a fan of the show and then had me in mind for the All Too Well video. And so she reached out and um, I was like, of course I'll do it. And what was it like hanging out with her? Did you get invited to the 4th of July party? <laughs> I've heard about these 4th of July parties. Um, you know, she's such a grounded, um, genuine person. So to have someone like that, that I can look up to, like, it, what's I your, really What's important. your go-to Taylor song that you love? Ooh, um... <sighs> right now it's August. Yeah, that's a great, that's that's a good a one. great song. That is a good one. But I want to know, because that's a good question, but in the show, yeah. When you go to when Vecna comes for yeah. you, you have to play this song. Yes. Running up the hill by Kate Bush mm -hmm. is like the jam. 
But if you had to choose one song yeah. to get out of that nightmare, which one would you choose? Because mine would be Push It by Salt and Pepper. Okay? <laughs> That's good. I can That's run for a lot of people with Push It going on. Yeah. I mean, I've been saying August. Yeah. Um, also, this is uh, Instant Crush by Daft Punk would be a oh, good one for me. Daft Punk a is a good one. one. What's yours? Um, what would I do? I would probably do... Jeez. Bad Girl. Talking about bad girls, bad girls. <laughs> Talking about bad. You were like, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> By the way, you're incredible. Oh, thank you. Congratulations on all of your success. We're so happy for you. Thank you so, so much. So beautiful. What an impressive young lady. What a popular show. So thanks, Sadie. We should mention that you can find volume four of Stranger Things on Netflix. But something tells me you already knew that. Coming up, we've got a glimpse of Harrison Ford during his Raiders of the Lost Ark days that you're going to not want to miss. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. We had a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. It's a can't miss summer on today. Bam! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation? Vicky has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. Welcome back. Harrison Ford is unmistakable as Indiana Jones ahead of his milestone 80th birthday. We thought we'd take a little look back here at him discussing Raiders of the Lost Ark, his first film where he stars as the adventuring archaeologist. And he did this right here on Today back in 1981. Take a look. A great deal of it uh, comes comes from, from the actor, or from me in this case. Uh, and it doesn't always happen that way unless there's a there's the right atmosphere and there's a unless the director wants that input the actor's capable of giving it and the circumstances are correct for them to work together uh, and in this case that was certainly true it was a very collaborative feeling uh, between Stephen and I Harrison is contributing so much to the writing of the script, to the story, to just the general feeling of the film. He's, he's, he probably, I'm not going to get too superlative here because I work with some incredibly inventive actors, but he's one of the most inventive actors I've ever worked with who deals on a level that is so human and so identifiable. His ideas are all of our ideas. There's great precedent for reinventing things in the, in the movie business. And as much as, as, they're, as they are based on, at least in these guys' minds, on, on uh, certain efforts from the past, they themselves have made something totally new. God, it's really cool to see that all these years later. Happy early birthday to you, Mr. Ford. All right, another Pop Star Plus for you. Hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you again tomorrow. So long.
Okay, I'm going to name two of the most popular movies of our lifetime, and I want you to pause for a moment and just remember the joy those movies brought to you. Okay, ready? You've got mail and Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants. Come on! They're too good. And both of those screenplays were co-written by my guest today. She has also written dozens of books, many of which are bestsellers. I'm talking today with Delia Ephron. Now, her last name may sound familiar to you. She's the younger sister of Nora Ephron, queen of the romantic comedy, a voice for a generation of women. Get this, she wrote When Harry Met Sally and Sleepless in Seattle. I happened to pick up Delia's latest book, Left on 10th, A Second Chance at Life. And I'm wondering, man, why haven't we also been talking about Delia all these years? Here's what you should know about Delia. Just like her sister, her writing is incredible. It's so beautiful. I just didn't want to put the book down. But she doesn't just write to pay bills. She writes to heal. Oh, my God, I'm so excited to see you. You are brilliant. Come on. (laughs) <laughs> I, I, they're not thank enough you. there's not enough dog ears or highlighters for this book <laughs> oh my goodness thank you so much wow that's wonderful wow you're just what we the doctor ordered for this time in life oh thank <laughs> you very much <laughs> that's really good to wow hear. first of all what a delight it is to see you in person i have to say um there are books that are packed with life lessons This one's overflowing. It's called Left on 10th, A Second Chance at Life. And I want to talk about the second chance, but can I just talk about the first chance first? Can we go back to the beginning? (laughs) Do you mind? Of course, whatever. (laughs) I'm sure, Delia, a lot of people um, know you by, they know your last name very well, uh, Efron. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, of course, know Nora Efron. I mean, I know for a lot of your life, you grew up and you have siblings. You've got Nora as your older sister. You've got two younger siblings. Mm-hmm. What? How would you describe yourself in the group of four? Oh, I was the funny one. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, we all get the little label in yeah. the family, and that was my label. Um, I'm not sure what my other sisters were labeled, but that was definitely. And every time I said something funny at dinner, my father would shout, "That's a great line. Write it down." <laughs> so. I mean, we were all for we're all for writers, and my parents were writers, and they were just raising writers. I mean, my mother was very proud that she had a career, and she was a screenwriter, and uh, she was, I mean, really fierce about it. Mm. And that's what her daughters: you will go to New York, and you will have a career. That's all she said. She never said a thing about about getting married, having children, nothing. Wow. In fact, she often said, "Elope." Oh, she did? How come? Oh, yes. I mean, a a mother of four daughters who was not the least interested in seeing her daughter's wedding. I mean, that was my mother. When you say that she was a writer, she she and your father were more than just writers. I mean, they were writers. Tell me some of the work they put out. Well, they wrote, well, first of all, you you made a lot more movies then. And they were were contract writers at 20th Century Fox, and they wrote... um, Daddy Long Legs with Fred Astaire. They wrote No Business Like Show Business with um, Marilyn Monroe. They wrote The Jackpot with Jimmy Stewart. But th- they wrote continually. Mm-hmm. They just had a very nice run in the 50s. So with your mom uh, not stressing marriage and stressing yeah. a career, did you think, um, were you interested in, in marriage or did was what she said the gold standard? I got her message very loud and clear. But I also saw a movie when I was about 11 called Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, which is the most, oh, it's just, it's the romantic comedy of all time. I mean, it really is. It's all about Jane Powell. She 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 marries this, in one afternoon, she falls in love with a backwoodsman and moves to the backwoods to make flapjacks for his six brothers. And all I wanted to do was get married and make flapjacks for someone. I saw that movie 16 times. I learned the power of a romantic comedy very young. Wow, wow. I really did. So there was a little war going on. Partly, you know, I wanted to have a career. I wanted to be that child. And uh, and the other part of me, I just wanted this other life. If you were not writing... Is there something else when you were a young kid that you thought you wanted to do? 
No. Look, my sister Nora was, she was like shot out of a cannon. And and she was going to be a writer when she was two. And we all knew it. And um, and so for me to be a writer, well, I had to not just take on my parents' career. I had to take on Nora's career. But I, I sort of, look, you can blow your 20s and still have a life. And I did blow my 20s. <laughs> I just married the first man who asked me. And I moved to Providence, Rhode Island. And I, I got to be about 28. And I thought, what am I doing here? You know, I, 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 you have one life, you know, get this through your, your head. So at this point I had a crochet business. All right. Mm -hmm. I was crocheting and I went to a party in, in New York and there was an editor there from Simon and Schuster. And I said to him, um, I know you'd never be interested in this, but would you like a book about crocheting? And he said, yes, he said, yes. And the next thing I knew, I wrote a book about crocheting. And I didn't think I was writing. I was sneaking up on it. You know, I was just writing directions for things. So then uh, I started to think, you know, I think I want to be a writer. Hmm. And I said to my husband, my first husband, that's a very important part of the story. Mm -hmm. I said to him, I think I want to be a writer. And you know how important it is to speak a dream out loud? Yes. And he said, uh, I don't want you to be a writer. And I said, why? And he said, suppose you become famous. I don't want you to become famous. This is how pathetic I was. I said to him, I promise I won't be famous. I'm, I'm actually worried I've been keeping that promise. But anyway, I, I absolutely knew. I absolutely knew I had to leave him. I mean, if someone wants to crush your dreams with his big fat foot, you just better get out. And so you did. So was, I, it, was the I, breakup hard? I, yeah. So then I... You know, I called my girlfriends in New York, and I got on a train, and I left Providence. And, and that was it. I thought, I have one year. I'm going to be a writer in one year. I'm going to have to do something else. Okay. And I figured out, I mean, I had messed up my 20s so badly that I, I made a plan. I, I really recommend making plans if you're going to make big changes. Okay. And I said, in a year, I have to get published in the New York Times. That was your plan? That's the only thing that's going to launch me. Now, where, I hate to compare you to your sister, but where was your sister's career at this point? Oh, my sister was writing this amazing column in Esquire mm -hmm. about being a woman, and she was an editor at Esquire, and she gave me one of my first assignments. But she was totally always mm -hmm. my, she was always a mentor. Yeah. I mean, she just loved my work. And, and I was about nine months, no, almost a year, really. I was down to $500. Mm. And I was sitting at home eating chocolate pudding my way. The type you cook, you know, so it yeah. had skin on the top. Film, yeah. And I was scooping the pudding out from underneath and saving the skin for last. And I thought, I'm eating like a child. This is how writers get ideas, by the way. This, okay. it's, this is ridiculous. And I thought, I'm going to write a piece about how children eat food. And I wrote 500 words about, I, they were just directions. I knew how to do that because I'd written these crochet books. So I wrote How to Eat Like a Child, and I sold it to the New York Times. Oh, my gosh. And they ran, it was very funny. I ran, it ran on the last page of the Sunday magazine, and on Monday I was offered a book contract. You are kidding. No, and, and that book was a bestseller, a huge bestseller. What was your, what was your how first to, book? How to Eat Like a Child and Other Lessons in Not Being a Grown-Up. Oh my God, brilliant. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. It feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now.
Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. I turn on my computer. I go online. Welcome. Welcome. And my breath catches in my chest until I hear three little words. You got, got mail. mail. So for people who don't realize, You've Got Mail was not just written by Nora Ephron. It was written by... Nora yeah. and Delia Efron. Right. Just in case, I'm just letting our listeners Thank know you they very may much. Or, they may or may not realize that. Um, so you know your career. You write your book. Your career is humming, but love is still something that you're you're looking for after you've written right. your first book. Um, how did you How did you meet your second husband? Um, he, uh, he was going to see a movie in the neighborhood with a good friend of mine, and they got the time wrong. She said, "Let's stop in and see Delia." And he walked up the stairs and was that like was that. That was it. You knew. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. I did get smarter about men. You know, I was saying to myself, you know from the beginning, people begin as they mean to continue. Mm. That is a rule I began to live by. People begin as they mean to continue. Okay. So if someone shows up late on your first date, they are going to always be late for a date. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. There, It's a very good rule when you take a job when you meet a boss. It's a rule for friendship, it's, and it turns out it's a great rule for men. What'd you learn about Jerry? Well, Jerry's a writer, and mm-hmm. I needed to be married to a writer, and he was just, the, he was just a wonderful man and mm-hmm. very, very supportive. It was just a great match. How many years did you, were you guys married? We were married 32, and we were together 38. Wow. I feel like in my life, everything good happened to me after 50, everything. So Mm -hmm. it seemed weird to me to think that sometimes it all lumps together. And also, conversely, sometimes the tough lessons all get jammed up at a certain time, too. I remember when your sister was sick. I didn't know Nora was sick. In fact, I think we had her on the show. And I remembered uh, not knowing about that because that was an illness that she kept private, right? Yes, she did. Everybody makes their own choices when they get sick. But if you were really famous and you're public about something like that, I mean, there's just, you know, you leave the house and someone says on the street corner, you know, I'm so sorry, are you okay? You know, Mm -hmm. there's no privacy at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, Nora was intensely private and she wanted to run her it the way she she just did. I mean, I'm not someone that that can keep secrets. I'm not someone who's suited to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was interesting how differently, I mean, just to me that, you know, because we were so alike in many ways. You know, it's hard for a lot of people, I'm sure, listening to imagine many of us have siblings and sisters and the idea that we're going to be holding our sister's hand. How, how did you navigate that, that grief? Well, the, the really difficult thing was that, I mean, she died in 2012, and for, and she was sick for the six years before. And at that time, they they tested me to see if I had was a match for her. She had uh, myelodysplastic syndrome, and it leads almost inevitably to a fierce leukemia. Mm-hmm. So the only thing that can cure it is a bone marrow transplant, uh, all, also known as a stem cell transplant. So they tested me, but they also discovered that my bone marrow was slightly wonky. Mm -hmm. So in addition to worrying about her, I was worrying about me. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, my husband had prostate cancer and it was going, and he was going to die from that, that had metastasized. So I was dealing with a level of anxiety during those years that was absolutely, I mean, really, I think back on it. I I mean, it was an astonishing thing amount of anxiety. Can can I ask uh, just to dig in a little bit cuz I keep hearing from people who are going through horrible grief. How did you go about a a typical day? Like how did you get out of bed to help your sister, help your husband, worry about yourself, go about your business? How how did you find that strength? I wrote. Mm. Um it was the same way I got over this trauma of getting leukemia myself. So um, your sister passed away, and 
it must have been, like you said, when you're a public person, your grief is public and so is the yeah. loss. Did you find comfort in knowing that other people felt the loss or did you kind of wish you could have just grieved on your own? You know, I think I actually, truthfully, I think I would have rather grieved on my own. I mean, I, I loved the love of my friends who just, you know, surrounded me with love and, and that was just incredible. But I, th I think, you know, this is just to be honest. I, I was trying to think about Caroline Kennedy. I'm thinking her whole life, someone said, walked up to her and said, um, I was driving on the on the Taconic when I heard your father died. I, you know, your father's picture is on my breakfast table, um, you know, whatever, on the wall in my house. I, I remember his, he was so incredible to me. And she is just getting mm -hmm. thousands of her whole life has been that. And there is a lot of wanting to share. Mm -hmm. And I completely understand that Nora was profoundly important for women and she was an amazing person. So it was both that I loved getting and also that it, it was overwhelming. Mm -hmm. It was a little overwhelming. Yeah. And then to still be in the process of, of caring for your husband at that point. Yeah. Um, and to mm -hmm. watch that, because that was, he was three more years before he passed. Yes. He passed in 2015. And what did you lose the day he passed? Well, just everything in my life changed because, um, you know, the strangest thing about living in a house that you've lived in with someone all those years, it's like they're, they're on the walls, they're in the kitchen with you, they're, but they're not, you know. They're, hmm. I'm sitting on his couch watching television in his office and I'm just feeling, you know, a, a tremendous displacement. Hmm. And everywhere I went, I felt like, what am I doing here? And and it's hard. By the way, it's very hard when someone dies because you've got you've got all the death certificates and you have to close out accounts and you have to change everything. And mm -hmm. people are not easy. I mean, and that's how I ended up. Yeah. When well, my internet <clears throat> crashed. Well, that is funny because <laughs> I mean, first of all, the fact that you guys had two landlines at your house, one in his name and one in yours, and all yeah. you want. Why did you want to cancel his landline? Like, that was something you just wanted to get done. It just seemed like a place to begin. Yeah. You know, it seemed like a place to begin. And one of the things about trying to cancel his landline is that it's a rite of passage for almost everyone who loses a mate mm. is canceling their, if their cell phone, if not their landline. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is one of the things. Because when I tried to do it and got into this terrible battle with my phone company and they they not only shut the landline down, but they then crashed my internet and couldn't get it back. Um, and I got so crazy that I wrote a very funny, sad piece about it for the New York Times. And I can't tell you how much mail I got. I mean, we got so much mail on that piece. And it was all people who'd had battles with their phone company. And in the same situation, I mean, it was, it was really, it, it's a really big thing. <laughs> right. When you're grieving and you're trying to take care of business at the same time and yeah. you keep running into roadblocks. You really can't go a little wild. I, saw, I went crazy. I actually did a little bit. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Hamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky, 
To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Well, in addition to the whole truckload of mail that you got and email, I'm sure, um, you got one special email, which you were, how, how old were you at that point when, you're, when your husband passed? 72. 72 years old and... All of a sudden, you get an email from a from a gentleman named Peter, and right. what? This wasn't his first interaction with you. No, we had had two. We still can't agree on how many dates we had because <laughs> I don't remember it at all. But I think it was two dates, but it might have been three. Fifty-four years before, when I was eighteen years old, and my sister Nora had fixed us up, so I got this very, very charming email from Peter, mm -hmm. who was a psychiatrist, a Jungian analyst living in the Bay Area. And he said, you know, we had, we had a couple of dates, but um, so it's just the most, it was the most charming note. It was lovely. And so of course I sent it to at least three girlfriends to see what they thought. Cause at that point I wasn't leaving the house practically without calling a girlfriend to mm -hmm. see if it was a good idea. So, um, I wrote him back. Well, first I Googled him, of course. What else? You know what I love about you? I mean, I'm, I'm just talking to you for the first time. Your heart didn't get hard. Like, it's not even, it doesn't, I mean, I'm sure it has a film on it because every heart does after going through some knocks and bumps. But yeah. to be giggly and, and excited and, and giddy uh, about an email um, is pretty cool to, to have that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was very frightened, though. I mean, there's a lot of guilt about surviving and losing your mate. And so I had sort of considered for the first time the idea of somebody else. And Peter didn't write me for five months after that. He wrote oh. me three days after the first anniversary of Jerry's death. Oh. And I think that year alone is a really, it's, you go through all the holidays, you go through um, all sorts of experiences um, in the first year. So I think it was just also... Beshert, which is the word that Peter and I use, Beshert, it's a Yiddish word meaning a destined soulmate or, or mm -hmm. something fated to be. And it, so it was very Beshert when I received it. Let's talk about the guilt part because that's an interesting piece. And I think anyone who's ever gone out on an, even a single date after losing a spouse is, is must struggle with that. How did you deal with it? What did you do? Well, I mean, I remember when he finally did come come to the house, which was, and he flew east then about three weeks later. And by that time, we had completely fallen in love over email, you know. I remember him being in the kitchen and thinking that Jerry was there in the kitchen with us, wow. you know, that I wasn't alone with Peter, huh. that he that he was there. And I, after being so able to talk about anything, I was suddenly shyer, different, hmm. worried, and um, and we had to really in a way, start again when you're 72, when death is so close, you can read out, reach out and touch it, you know? And so I got very frightened that, that weekend, although I was extremely attracted to him. So that did mitigate it a bit. Yeah. And he's the one, most wonderful person. Sometimes you meet a wonderful person like Peter and you're like, okay, I had my share of knocks. Um, I've already, I've lost two people I love and now it's finally time for my love, my second love story to start. But your, your doctor gave you a blood test like she'd been doing over the course of a long time. And 10 years, every six months, she tested my blood to see if I was okay. And every Every six months, she'd say, well, this is the most boring blood I've seen today, and send me off. She's a wonderful doctor. It was four months after Peter and I had just fallen head over heels for each other, and I went to my six-month appointment, and it just it just came up, leukemia, oh my just God. right there. It's so stunning to get 
a diagnosis like that, and it was confirmed that it was AML. Uh, but, you know, every leukemia is different under a microscope. In spite of it being that my sister had AML and I had AML, we had different AMLs, basically. Yeah. And my doctor just kept saying to me, you know, first of all, there are new treatments. I mean, the, it is amazing of blood cancer, the, the progress since 2012 when she died. Amazing. So there were new drugs and there were new treatments. And she said, and you're not your sister. Mm -hmm. uh, under a microscope, you're wow. not your sister. Wow. That's all she meant. But for me... You know, I mean, I just tried to be, I spent my the first years of my life just trying to do everything she did and, and failing miserably because she was going around the track so fast I couldn't keep up. But, um, you know, to say that to me when I, that I could survive and she wasn't able to, it was betrayal. Mm -hmm. It felt Ooh. like betrayal as well as empowerment. You know, it was both things at once. It was opposites, you know, and I just kept saying to myself, you're not your sister, you know, and maybe you can have a different outcome. At the time, your boyfriend, Peter, uh, in the middle of all this, who knows what what someone's going to do when they find out that the person that they've fallen for for four months is is very ill. What did what did Peter do? He'd flown in after my diagnosis and we were sitting and I'm making French toast and I'm thinking about, you know, I'm checking into the hospital Tuesday and I, my mind is very... And he's sitting at the table, and he says, we should get married. And then he kind of heard himself say it, and he's, he just, like, popped up out of the chair and said, will you marry me? <laughs> and I said, yes. And because we all, even Peter says he always knew we were going to get married. So I said yes, and then we went on uh, Monday. We went and got a license, and we bought a ring. And on Tuesday, I checked into the hospital. And on Thursday, I had my first. Uh, chemotherapy and on Saturday we got married where we had a very where? few friends come to the dining room on the 14th floor and and my friend Jesse presided and we got married at the hospital yeah at the hospital do you think about <laughs> how Nora might have had a play in this I mean how how many times do you guys well talk it about just that? you know I mean Peter says we were not meant to be together when we were young hmm. and that we met when we did was when we were we meant to meet, and I believe that's true too. But there's no question I feel like she had a hand in it. My, well, she had a hand in so much of my life, let's face it, but she certainly, this was really something when he said that Nora had fixed us up. You know what I and She was always fixing me up, by the way. But oh, she was? Never as beautifully as this, yes, right. <laughs> Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. You know what I find remarkable about you? I think if someone else was in your exact circumstances, losing a sister and then losing a husband, I can see a life going a completely different way. Like, I just oh. wonder, because I think it's easy to retreat and say, these are the cards I was dealt. And you know what? I already had my good times before. And maybe I should just ride this out and, you know, do my thing. Why do you think you did not become that person 
I actually think it's because I like to laugh. Oh, really? Yeah. I like to have fun. And I just think that didn't go away. Mm -hmm. That's all I can put it to. Delia Efron, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast. Thank you so much. I had so much fun. Oh, me too. Thanks for the laughs, too. See you later. Okay. Bye-bye. Some slices here. Good job. You okay? <laughs> Welcome to Dylan Dishes Cooking with Cal. In this Today All Day series, I'm looking back at some of my favorite Cooking with Cal recipes and sharing my top kitchen tips. Today's episode is one that we're calling Grandma's Greatest because it features recipes from two amazing grandmas. First up, you'll see me and Calvin whipping up my mom's pasta salad, and then we tackle my grandmother's short ribs. You know, one of the biggest obstacles timid cooks face in the kitchen is just not knowing where to start or what to make. Well, here's a good rule of thumb. Always cook what you know and what you loved growing up. Just think back to what your parents and grandparents always served. I've also found that family recipes are often the simplest, which is probably why our parents made them so often. This first recipe is proof of that. You only need five ingredients, pasta, canned tomatoes, black olives, parsley, and olive oil. Take a look. All right, so let's get the ingredients ready. How this thing works, we're gonna use a can of tomatoes, but these are cooked tomatoes. They're not raw tomatoes. So you'll like these because they're cooked tomatoes, okay? Now turn that as hard as you can. Use those muscles. Do you want some help? There we go. Do you know what these are? What? Olives. Black olives. On taste one, you haven't tried one in a long time. Ollie loves them. Ollie loves olives. A little bit. I love them. I could eat them like this. We got our tomatoes, our olives. You know what this is? What? Got some parsley. All right, you want to chop this for me? Why don't you put your hand like that? There we go. Good job. Now I'm just going to make these all a little smaller, okay? This adds a nice pop of green and a nice freshness to the whole dish. So a lot of times my mom would use elbow noodles, the ones that look like C's or U's as you call them. I felt like using tricolor pasta. You know why they call it tricolor pasta? Why? Because there's three colors. So this one is just made with wheat. This one has tomato in it. <gasps> and what do you think's in this one if it's green? Broccoli. Close. What else is green? What's green and leafy? Celery. Well, celery has some leaves. What looks like lettuce? Spinach. Yay! Cool. I'm gonna dump this in, okay? Oh, well, that's boiling. Can you dump a can of tomatoes in here? Now all of the olives, the parsley. Ah, good call, buddy. Good idea. Now we wait. Can you taste that? Mm -hmm. Perfect. All right, drain the noodle. All right, I want to pour these into this bowl. Dump a whole bunch of olive oil in here. All of it? Not all of it, I'll tell you what. All around, swirl it all around. A little salt. This will come out fast, so let's not. Let's give it a big stir. Before we put this in the fridge to let it cool down, let's taste it, okay? Mm-hmm. You like it? it? Tastes even better when it's cold. So I thought this was such an easy recipe, but you guys had a lot of questions about it, so let's get to them. First, what's the last seasoning you put on this salad? Just salt and pepper. I think there's not a lot of seasoning or anything that goes into this salad, so if I sprinkle anything on it, it's, it's really just salt and pepper. I'm a big fan of salt and pepper. Next question, did you drain the tomatoes? Uh, no, I put the whole can with the diced tomatoes and the liquid because some of the pasta absorbs some of that liquid, so um, it, it helps to add some moisture to the dish. 
Another viewer asked, do you think it would still be tasty without the olives? Yes, the thing that's the best part about this recipe is this is just a base. If you don't like olives, if you don't like parsley, leave them out. If you want to put some cube cheese in there or some pepperoni, throw that in. Uh, really, it's just about a base. And if you like it a little tangier, you could probably throw in some Italian dressing. It's, it's just a basic, basic pasta salad. This is the way we always made it, but feel free to change it up however you want. Another question about olives, are they sliced black olives? Yes, I kept this recipe even simpler by buying the actual pre-sliced black olives, um, but you can buy regular olives and slice them up. I bet if you like it tangy, it would even taste good with green olives too. And another question about the tomatoes. What brand of tomatoes do you use? I'm not uh, that loyal to a particular brand, uh, but I do love San Marzano tomatoes whenever you can find them, whether you're using diced tomatoes or you're using you know, crushed tomatoes to make a sauce. San Marzano tomatoes are just a little bit sweeter, so you don't have to add the sugar to them, and they just, they're, they're straight from Italy, and they're just absolutely delicious. Slightly more expensive, but totally worth it, I promise. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Allie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? Is. Hallie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. From New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the press now. Streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Dylan Dishes, Cooking with Cal. This episode is all about celebrating family recipes passed down from generation to generation. And Kelvin absolutely loves his grandma's recipe for pasta salad, and I absolutely love my grandma's recipe for short ribs. So my grandmother lived in an apartment that my dad built above our garage in our house. So it was always special when we kind of walked up the stairs to my grandmother's apartment for dinner. Her home was always warm, and cozy and it always just smelled so good. Whether it was, you know, beef and barley soup or these short ribs. I just remember it was always like a meat and potatoes or a hearty dish. And we'd all just sit around at her brown dining room table and it just, it was just special. We were still home, but we were over Graham's house eating one of her recipes and they were always so delicious. For this recipe, you'll need short ribs, paprika, chili powder, poultry seasoning, onion, tomato paste, egg noodles, peas, and salt and pepper. Say hi, Mammy. Hi, Mammy. Hi, Cal. How, How are you today? I asked you for the recipe, and you said, you know, you just throw the meat in a dish, you throw this together, you put it on top, you, you cover it for a little, you cook it for a little. There was no written instructions with the recipe, so a lot depended on looking at it, 
seeing what it's doing, throw it in the oven a little bit longer, that kind of thing. Well, I wish you could be here with me to help make this and, and especially eat it with us. It's going to be a tight squeeze, but we'll see if we can get them all here. Okay. There we go. They're all squeezed in there, right? Yeah. More okay. right. salt, pepper. Now we have to slice up an onion. Oh, what if I close my eye? I know. Can I close my eye? Well, then it's hard to cut and close your eyes at the same time. Okay. I'm gonna make some slices here. Good job. You okay? <laughs> We've got all kinds of spices here, okay? Are we gonna mix them up? Yeah, but first. I want you to scoop all of this tomato paste into here as well, okay? okay. You pour this water in there. I cannot do it. Because you're here to help me. Okay, so now we're going to pour all of this all over our short ribs. Now we're going to bake them. And then we're gonna bake them, you're right. So all we have to do, we're gonna cover this with foil. We're gonna bake it for like 45 minutes. 45 minutes, I have to, right? <laughs> That's right. Put it back in the oven without the foil so it finishes cooking. Where's the noodle? This tastes exactly like my grandma's. Is hers yummy? Hers is so yummy. One of the questions I get asked all the time is what are the tools you use with Calvin in the kitchen? And knives are the big question because I'm cooking with a kid and here he is chopping some vegetables. So when I first started cooking with Calvin, I did all the chopping. I didn't want him anywhere near a knife. He did the stirring, he did the breaking of the eggs, he did all that. Then once he wanted to participate more, I found these knives. Um, they're plastic knives, you can find them anywhere online. So they're, they're sharp enough to cut, but they're not really sharp enough that Calvin would cut his finger. <laughs> so the best vegetables this works for are something like zucchini, something like cooked potatoes, uh, hard boiled egg would be good, soft fruits like berries or pears. And you know, it takes, takes a little little bit of strength but at least it you know is not going to hurt them and it kind of just gets them used to you know some knife skills i would also you know kind of do this for calvin i chop this up with my knife and then just give him a little bit to just sort of learn how to rock the knife learn how to keep his hands out of the way and just really basic knife skills with with soft fruits and vegetables that's what these knives are good for Eventually, it became a thing though where you know, you're making soup and you're chopping some harder stuff like carrots and onions. So I needed to upgrade a little bit and I found these great knives. This is an actual knife. I mean, it's, it's sharp and it will cut through your hard vegetables. But the thing I love about it is it also comes with this shield. So it teaches you the proper way to cut. So Calvin can put his hand here and he learns, you know, you stick your finger through this hole so he learns you know not to put his finger under here so his hand placement is good on the knife and then he learns to kind of rock but look at how this is like a real sharp knife for a kid but it's all safe the hand that's holding the knife knows how to hold it properly the hand that's holding the food knows how to hold it properly so that your fingers are kept out of the way the thing i love about this brand is that it also comes with a peeler Calvin loves apples and pears. Obviously he loves carrots, but he does not like the skin on anything. He'd peel a blueberry if he could. So the same kind of thing. You stick your finger in the hole and then it teaches you to just have your fingers out of the way. So my job is to make sure he holds, you know, the right end and isn't like, you know, doing it the wrong way. 
And this thing's role is to make sure Calvin holds this the right way. So you can see how sharp they are, they work. So once your kid masters the plastic knife, I think it's good to upgrade to the real deal. The next time you go to your parents or your grandparents' house, look through their recipe boxes. You may just find some delicious gems that you totally forgot about. But until then, I hope you'll try my family recipes and let me know what you think. For all these recipes, go to today.com slash Dylan Dishes. So first, what you're going to need is breadcrumbs, Italian seasoning, olive oil, and shredded <laughs> mozzarella cheese. <laughs> My name is Peyton Janicki, and this is Kids in the Kitchen. I'm Peyton Janicki, I'm eight years old, and I'm in third grade. My earliest memory of cooking is when I was younger, I used to help my grandma make apple and pumpkin pies for Thanksgiving. I love cooking with my grandma because she's very nice and she's also a really good cook, and at the end I get to eat it. <laughs> we need to add some chicken broth. Um, with a pot of oil in it, um, and you need to let that sit before we add the couscous. My favorite thing about having my YouTube channel, Practically Peyton, it's basically just cooking and just like, it's not even, it's not even hard for me. It's, it's really fun. I love to cook for my mom, my dad, and my little brother, Michael. I also bake for my dog sometimes. For his first birthday, I helped bake him a cake. And it was basically just dog food, but shaped into like a bone shape. And it also came with some icing for dogs. He loved it so much. Some of my favorite hobbies are softball, swimming, dance, basketball, singing, and piano. When I grow up, there's three things that I might want to be. I want to be a teacher, a chef, and an art teacher because I love to do art. I think that cooking is basically kind of like art. I might put in the wrong ingredient and I still want to see how it turns out. It's basically like mixing paint colors. Today I'm so excited because I get to show you how to make Nanny's stuffed chicken breast and roasted broccoli. A couple of years ago, my Nanny's created this recipe because she was really good at making chicken cutlets and she knew one of my favorite foods was pepperoni. So she magically put the pepperoni in the chicken cutlets and it was amazing. Okay guys, let's get started. I'm so excited. Make sure you preheat the oven to 425 degrees. First thing is we are going to line this cookie sheet with foil and then we're gonna spray it with some non-stick baking spray. I love using foil because it makes cleanup super easy. The first ingredients that you're gonna need is breadcrumbs, Italian seasoning, olive oil, and shredded mozzarella cheese. I like using shredded mozzarella cheese because you don't have to shred it. And it's just like so hard shredding it and you can get hurt shredding it. In a small bowl, I'm going to add breadcrumbs, Italian seasoning, olive oil, and mozzarella cheese. This is my topping. The cheese and the olive oil are going to make the chicken brown, crispy, and delicious. So now you're gonna grab your thin chicken breast, salt, pepper, mozzarella cheese, pepperoni, and sour cream. The thinner the chicken breast, the better, because we're kind of making a pepperoni sandwich. And the bun is the chicken. Place half of the chicken breast on the prepared foil. Now we're 
gonna season it with salt and pepper. This is like sprinkling fairy dust. Now we're gonna sprinkle it with a half a cup of shredded mozzarella cheese. You wanna make sure you spread it evenly throughout the four chicken breasts. You don't wanna skip out on the cheese. My brother loves cheese, so I think I'm gonna give him a little bit extra. He'll thank you later. My favorite step of this whole thing, adding the pepperoni. So you wanna add three pieces of pepperoni on each slice, each piece of chicken. What I love most about pepperoni is probably like it has like a little spice to it. It has like a little hotness. I love pepperoni so much. I even eat it for breakfast sometimes. And secretly I try to sneak it into all of my recipes. Now we're gonna place the other half of the chicken on top of all of these pieces of chicken. Now we're going to put a thin layer of sour cream onto the chicken. This has a really good flavor, it, and it also helps make the breadcrumbs stick to the chicken. It's kind of like frosting a cake. Now we are going to put the breadcrumb mixture on top of the chicken. I like this breadcrumb mixture because it makes the chicken like nice and crispy and it gives a different but good flavor. See, this is the magic of the sour cream because it's sticking perfectly. This is looking so good, I can't wait to eat it. Now it's time to put this in the oven. It looks great, but I can't do it since I'm a kid, so I need help from my dad. Dad! Now we're gonna bake that for 20 minutes, and in the meantime, I'm going to bake one of my most favorite side dishes, roasted broccoli. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at eight on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson now, weekdays at five on NBC News Now. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. 
for breaking news in our changing world. Download the NBC News app. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Fun fact, it is actually like when you get any vegetable and put salt, pepper, olive oil, and garlic powder like on top of it and bake it, it'll taste amazing. I actually won't eat broccoli any other way. I always bake it this way and I love it. Now the first thing we're gonna do is cut the broccoli into florets, but you can also just pull them apart and then you can have a parent cut it a little bit more after. Now that we're getting to the middle, I'm just gonna leave this for mom. Mom, can you come help me? Let's cut the broccoli. Make sure they're at a similar size so they roast evenly. Well, you're a fast cutter. Now, you're gonna add olive oil. Salt. Pepper. And garlic powder. Now you wanna mix this really well. And cooking can get messy, so Do it with your hands. It feels like, I don't know, like, have you ever like felt foam beads for like slime? It feels like that, but like wet and a little bit like more like crunchy. You wanna make sure they're in one row or layer because if it's not, it'll just steam instead of getting all like crispy and delicious. It's time to put this baby in the oven, but I need help. Dad? Now we have to wait 10 minutes. It's starting to smell so good, so that's a good sign. I'm getting super hungry too. Look at how amazing this looks. It looks so delicious. The chicken, it looks so crispy and good, and the broccoli, it look, the same. It, it looks very crispy and good. It just, I imagine it in my mouth. Tasting so good. All right, let's plate it. I'm gonna play another one because I have a special guest. I can't wait until she arrives. She's gonna love this meal. Oh my gosh, perfect timing, she's here. you were sniffing when you just came in. Oh, I can't wait to eat it. Thank you so, thank you so much. You're welcome. You did a great job. Mm. You make this exactly like I did. Okay, let's Actually, see how it tastes. Yours, I think, tastes even better. <laughs> it's so delicious. I love sharing meals with you. Anytime. <laughs> even if it's not this dish. <laughs> I love you so much. I love you too.
I loved having you guys in the kitchen today. I hope you'll keep this recipe in mind and share it with someone special too. Bye! Yeah, this is nuts. Hey, but taking on a challenge is a lot like riding a horse, and if you're comfortable while you're doing it, you're probably doing it wrong. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? The wise words of Ted Lasso, the wise man Carson returns. You know, we all love Ted Lasso, and one of the reasons is he's just always so optimistic. And yeah. there's a reason that all of us should be channeling our inner Ted Lasso, because there's a new study out, guys, that basically says if you're optimistic, if you see the world with a glass half full, uh -huh. you actually live longer, uh, an extra four years, in fact. Yeah, this is no, it was a study, it was a woman's yeah. health study, so yeah. this has to do yes. with women. I'm assuming it applies to men as well. And they follow a large group of women over a, a long period of time, most optimistic, nearly 160,000 women were involved in the study. They had a 10% greater chance of living beyond 90. Wow. wow. Let me, you know what? I'd like to put an exhibit up. Her name is Sammy Cotby, my mom. Hoda's mother. She's oh, yes. 86 years old. Yeah, the I have, most positive, yeah. beautiful, full of life, does everything. Well, Hoda's that yeah, right where too. have you That's seen right. that before? But, you know, it's exactly. funny about her. But it's We're, true. She's a, we go to the beach and, it sh and it's cloudy. She'll go, oh my, God, I think I see some sun. <laughs> we don't see it. Well, no, no, it's right. coming. But I think she has that thing of fixing your gaze yeah. on the beautiful thing instead she of the, the trash in the road. Mm -hmm. yes. She's done it since we're kids. How do you do that? I think it's just, it's like what she chooses. chooses to like, what would you choose to look at in this moment? Is it hot in the studio? Is it beautiful? Am I sitting next to a wonderful person in yeah. a great table? Yeah. Or am I thinking to myself, yeah. oh, it's raining outside? Well, you know, the like, other thing is, it, it probably makes you live longer. Yeah. Yep. But even yeah. if it didn't, it makes your today better. Yeah. yeah. So, you know? And you make yeah. the people around you feel better. Yes. Some very hopeful news for the tens of thousands of Americans who are diagnosed every year with rectal cancer. It's one of the most lethal kinds. Well, in a new study, an immunotherapy drug delivered unheard of results. Every single patient involved in this trial seemingly cured. Yeah, that headline just grabbed us. NBC medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar joins us with what we need to know. Dr. Azar, when I saw this headline, I was like, this is a miracle. This is what we've been waiting right. for. There, it's a small group, just right. 12 people, but what does this particular study tell you? I know, Hoda. I'm so happy to be reporting this yeah. this morning. So <clears throat> this was immunotherapy that is used in uh, what's called locally advanced rectal cancer. So that's stage two or stage three. That means it's gone to the lymph nodes, but it hasn't metastasized. And the standard of care for this kind of cancer usually involves chemotherapy, radiation, and then surgery, which, as you can imagine, leaves people with significant disability. Mm -hmm. And only about 25% of those folks will, will have a, a clinical remission. With this immunotherapy, the patients that they study, they want to enroll 30, they've enrolled 16, we have data on 12. All 12 of them experienced a complete clinical remission after six months. I mean, it's a I, I know, and it's like, you know, you almost want to say that again, because yes, it's a small number, but that's 100%. Yeah. And you know, the, the researchers involved in this trial have said, what makes this so different? Yeah. Because not all immunotherapy is this dramatically successful. Is there something about the gut microbiome? Like, you know, they're sort of right. speculating as to why. But nonetheless, this is what happened. It's important to note that immunotherapy, of course, does not work for every sure. person with rectal cancer. Only about 5 to 10 percent of people with rectal cancer have that right mutation that oh. this particular drug targeted. But nonetheless, for the folks who experience this kind of, uh, you know, treatment response, it is mm -hmm. life changing. I mean, a lot of folks are, are watching and listening and, and wondering, what could this mean yes. for other types of cancer, other right. treatments? And so this is what is so special and unique about immunotherapy, is that it's not specific to an organ. Mm. It's specific to this mutation that oh. multiple different cancers actually have. So it was used in rectal cancer, but it's being studied in a variety of other cancers. I think we have a graphic for our viewers. It can be used in gastrointestinal cancers, mm -hmm. endometrial cancer, breast, prostate, bladder, thyroid. Yeah. And these researchers are also enrolling folks with early pancreatic cancer, which we know, of course, is traditionally very well, challenging to treat. We know you're going to keep your eye on this one, That's Dr. Azar. Good news. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC.
you've seen it is exclusive. Cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? You tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. I had an accident when I worked for MTV in 1997, one of my first years there. My back pain began when I was 24 years old on the road with MTV in Aspen, Colorado, when I injured my back in a snowmobile accident. I was on a snowmobile being shuttled down by a ski patrol and we got into like an accident, one of those really scary moments. Um, I suffered a T12 compression fracture which in the world of back injuries is actually not that bad. The doctor said, this is gonna be about, and I'll never forget, he goes, pain management, which would be a term that I'd have to come to learn about for the next 25 years. My back pain impacted my mental health, really all aspects of my life, including my workouts at Tiger Schulman's with my trainer and life coach, Sensei George. One of the things I gotta commend you for is your spirit and the way you push yourself, regardless of what you feel throughout the day. It gets frustrating when I have to modify so much because of my lower back. We'll do all types of different exercises to strengthen your back, but at the same time with the injury, you're still limited. Once you get that procedure, I think it's gonna be a brand new unit, a lot more sunshine to your days too. <laughs> the pain was there, I dealt with the pain, but it didn't really slow me down until later. For 25 years, I tried everything you could think of. Physical therapy, sports massages, even yoga and Pilates. Nothing seemed to work. I've tried literally everything. So this procedure is really considered my Hail Mary. It's like the last thing I could do to possibly get relief because honestly, nothing really worked. It's affected my interaction with my family, it really has. The one thing I love to do is just get down on the ground and let them jump on me and roll around and play. And that's the stuff that I can't do, especially with Goldie, my two-year-old. I'm like, okay, here we go, and I have to get low. And it's like, I ooh and I awe. Like, I mean, I've turned into my father. To help solve my back pain, pain management doctor Kieran Patel, who's director of neurosurgical pain at Lenox Hill Hospital in New York, told me about a breakthrough procedure called Intracept. The Intracept procedure is a procedure for patients who have vertebrogenic back pain, meaning the bones in the lower back are what's causing the pain. And these are patients who've had more than six months of pain and have failed conservative management. We're able to now see through MRI and imaging a much clearer look as to what exactly is going on in there. So let me actually show you Carson's MRI and you can see the type of changes that are in the bone. What we can see here at his, the bottom levels of his spine, L5 and S1, we see that there are these white changes here and that signifies those modic changes, the changes in the bone that are causing his pain. To stop the pain, the doctor goes in with a probe, heats up the nerve root that prevents the nerve from sending signals to the spinal cord and then the brain. So you can think of the basic vertebral nerve ablation, like turning off notifications on your cell phone. And that's gonna essentially cut off the phone call that your back makes to your brain every time you move and you go, ouch, it's just not gonna get that signal. You're just gonna interrupt a phone call from my, my, my vertebrae to my brain. On the day of the procedure, I was excited, but also a bit skeptical whether this was really going to work after years of pain. Moment. Today's the day. Out. I'm so excited. Are you excited? Yeah. I am I'm too. nervous, but I'm excited. I'm excited for you. Yeah. So they're going to take you in, and they're going to have you breathe through a mask and give you general anesthesia. And then what do you do? You go in very small, three millimeter inc yeah. like probe incision. Yeah. So this is very like non-invasive, right? This is very non-invasive. So. The incisions are literally the size of a baby aspirin. Have you ever done this before? Of course I've done this before. <laughs> no, actually, today's the first day. <laughs> Good. You're, you're number one. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yes. 
from somebody who's like suffered from like lower back pain for so long, it's almost too good to be true. I'm Come on, excited. everybody, pump it up, slow clap. Here we go. Come on. <laughs> I love you all. It's been nice to seeing you. Hope to see you on the other side. Doing jumping jacks. <laughs> After about two hours, I was in the recovery room. Everything went really well. I was very happy with where we put the probes. I think we got to the center of the nerve, and I'm, I'm excited. Well, I'm excited. You know, is it normal to feel like a little bit of soreness still from the procedure itself? Yeah, yeah. You might feel like some achiness. So we'll see what what this you know what happens um, with the sharp pain in the next few days. What is the I'm record number of animal crackers that somebody's eating? <laughs> I have hope again that I can kind of ramp back up my physical, um, you know, activities so that I can get back on a, on a healthy path, which is what we all want to do. We all want to be around for a while for our kids. And for patients who have modic changes and pain with bending and flexing and reaching, you know, that pizza making movement right. and dishwashing movement that you and I talk about, yeah. um, this is really helpful. Well, I, ha I got away with years of not having to do the dishes. <laughs> so now I'm a little worried that I'm gonna, Siri's gonna put me right back in the kitchen because <laughs> I'm, I'm running out of excuses. Well, I don't know. I don't think I can write your letter for that one. Okay. <laughs> well, I really appreciate everything and um, I look forward to the recovery. All right, look at that. Let's go. Look at you. Look sure, do the dishwasher. <laughs> look at you. Feels good. It really does. A couple of things I just want to say about it. First of all, there was a four month appeal process. To, my insurance covered it. Okay. Right? People need access to health care. Yes. And it took a long time. I had to write letters, there was appeals, it was a newer procedure. Some people it takes twice as long as that. So hopefully shining a light on it, that process can get better. Because yeah. people need to have access yeah. to this, number one. Number two, um, the mental versus mental pain, uh, mental illness versus physical illness. For years, I was too scared to ever get an MRI because of my panic attacks, mm. yeah. because that's so claustrophobic. Oh, yeah. So I put this whole thing off for years. Mm. I discovered a stand-up MRI. It's a good option for oh. anybody out there that, that has, they're worried about the same thing. It's not as claustrophobic, and the imaging I got worked for this. Yeah. It was okay. suffice. Okay. Is this a cure-all? You... It is not a cure-all. Oh, but I'm glad I did it. I am like 60 to 70% better. A lot of the sharp pains in my back, like mm. you said, this little bend, yeah. almost like at a golf address, yeah. this was the culprit for me in the lower back and yeah. this does not hurt right here at all wow so it's it's really great i want to thank dr patel uh yael our crew matt yeah. all the guys who had to endure me in a backless <laughs> hospital gown <laughs> Uh, very sorry about that, fellas. There's the crew right there. They were fantastic. Oh, my gosh. Um, and what else? Yeah, and it's it's been really... I, I'm ramping up the physical activity now, but, yeah. I mean, it gives you hope. If you have back pain, I mean, you wear pain. You don't even realize you're wearing it anymore, yeah. constantly groaning. And, and Well, by the way, you mentioned the mental aspect, too. It's like when you're in pain, that also yeah. is You teeter depressing. on depression. Yes. yes, absolutely. But you know what? Last night... Uh, we had a barbecue with my family and friends, and my kids uh, came over to me and said, Dad, will you play running bases with us? Which for years I have not done. Yeah. Yeah. And I looked at him and I said, you're damn right I will. And you beat him. And I got out there smoked and I just it? sat there and just threw them all out. Wow. And that, that's what it's about. Yes. Yeah. It's that's not about awesome. anything else yeah. to me. Uh, that and dishes. Able... Just yeah. doing dishes. No, not the dishes. No. <laughs> Funny thing, I still can't do the dishes. It's, it's, a great, yeah. it's weird. A different set of muscles. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. It's a can't-miss summer on today. They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on Today. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive.
Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Just 98 days after the birth of her son last March, Kate Sippel had a sudden and shocking health scare. My whole body just hit the ground like a big lump. Almost like a paralysis? Yes, completely. She was just 37. She knew something was wrong, which is why she was surprised by the reaction she got when she met with doctors. Once you got to the hospital, what did they tell you? They pretty much told me I had conversion disorder, which is where you put yeah, stress into clinical signs. So doctors effectively said, this is all in your head. Yes. After going to two different doctors, she was finally able to see a neurologist who ordered an emergency MRI. And finally, the third doctor, the neurologist says, something's wrong and you need to go back immediately. Correct. To the hospital. Correct. It turns out she was having 10 to 15 minor strokes per day. The diagnosis, a rare disease known as Moya Moya, where at least one major artery to the brain is blocked and new blood vessels form to make up for the blockage. The name Moya Moya, a Japanese term for puff of smoke, which is what the disease can often look like on diagnostic scans. And they said, well, here's the medication we're going to have you on and um, you'll be fine. You know, we can live with a couple TIAs here and there. TIAs meaning those mini strokes. Correct. But for Kate, that risk was still too great. Frustrated and with hope waning, Kate wrote a letter to her son, unsure if she would live to raise him. What did you say to him? I want to be there to give you so much advice and hug and kiss you every day. I am sorry I can't be. I hope this is all for nothing and I will be able to grow old and tell you all of these things in person. I love you, your mama. Took a lot of bravery. Yeah. Thinking of her baby boy and the family she loves, Kate refused to give up and reached out to the Cleveland Clinic where experts say although her specific disease is rare, it is more common in women and that strokes in general are more common than people think. In fact, every year, nearly 800,000 Americans suffer from a stroke, nearly 240,000 of them experiencing transient ischemic attacks, or TIAs, also known as mini-strokes like Katie's, which can be harder to detect and often serve as a warning for a larger stroke to come. People and family members, they're experts on themselves. Dr. Andrew Russman was part of the team that treated Kate at the Cleveland Clinic. Weakness or numbness or speech difficulty or trouble with vision or balance, seek the stroke expertise in the emergency department when you're having those symptoms. What would have happened to Kate if she didn't get the diagnosis when she did? The fact that she didn't ignore her symptoms, that was a critical difference in preventing her from having a more disabling stroke. <gasps> For Kate, the diagnosis came just in time. In November of last year, Cleveland Clinic doctors were able to do a bypass surgery, creating a new source of blood flow to her brain. She's been stroke free ever since. Since the surgery? None. Not a single mini stroke? No. Do you feel any of the numbness or tingling or paralysis? No, not at all. What do you hope that other people take away from your story? I hope that people realize, don't take the first opinion as, as it is what it is. People need to be their own advocates. They need to find someone that can help them. Do you think that your own persistence saved your life? A hundred percent. If I wouldn't have called, if, if I wouldn't have had a family support system to say, you're right, you need to do something about this, I truly do not think I would be here today. Ooh. So a reminder to everyone watching, if you do think you might be experiencing signs of a stroke, experts really stress the FAST method. So F for face drooping. If one side of your face is uneven or numb and you're unable to do something as simple as smile evenly. And then there's A for arm weakness or numbness, S for speech difficulty. And if you're experiencing any of these, T means it's time to call 911. Well, it's so good that she kept going back yeah. to doctors after the first or second time. She did. But her, her symptoms at first 
first weren't so noticeable. It wasn't something that was like a, a big red flag, was it? And that's what's crazy. Yeah. I mean, she said the doctors just kind of didn't believe yeah. her. They thought it was psychosomatic. But yeah. instead, she says you really have to pay attention because if you have tingling yeah. Yeah. on just one side, like your arm or your yeah. leg, that's something to pay attention to. But also a headache that's just so severe or unrelenting. That's the type of thing that they say you should really focus on and pay attention to and then go to your doctor and fight like Kate did. But which, to, to yeah. your point, yeah. being an advocate. Right. Being an advocate yeah. for your own health care. Yeah. But just... also trust your gut. Yes. I mean, you know yes. your body. If you think yes. like, but by golly, I just know I there's know. something wrong, yeah. trust yourself. Get exactly. No matter how old or young or yeah. how unusual you may think that yeah. is for your age bracket. Good, Good for you telling Morgan. that story. Thank you, Morgan. A new study out this morning published in the BMJ Global Health Journal reveals that more than 14% of people worldwide have or have had Lyme disease, which you can get from ticks. Over the last 20 years, researchers found the numbers have been going up, and men over the age of 50 who live in rural areas are the most at risk. Mm -hmm. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar joins us with more. Always a worry, especially in summertime when yeah. you're out in the Absolutely. woods with kids. 14%, does that strike mm -hmm. you as a, a big number? It did strike us as a big number, absolutely. And I think, you know, the way I would frame it is this. If you are unlucky enough to get bitten by a tick that's carrying the bacteria that causes Lyme, but you're fortunate enough to present with sort of very classic symptoms, like a flu-like illness followed by that characteristic rash that looks like a, that bullseye rash, the diagnosis in that scenario is fairly easy to make. And antibiotics instituted early can definitely be quite effective. But as we were discussing before we started the segment, a lot of folks don't have that rash. Only about three quarters of patients do. And if you don't treat early, you can develop these long, rather debilitating symptoms, joint symptoms. Yeah, heart, I was going to say, how do you know if you have it? That's the problem. So, so, yeah. so early on, you, yeah. there, there is that characteristic yeah. rash that we always talk about. But after that, patients can present with you know, central nervous system, fatigue, fatigue yeah. headache, and sure. real actual well, neurologic deficits as well as, as heart so and cardiac So how do you protect things. yourself if you're, if you're going out? Exactly. So here's sort of the rule of thumb. Know what to expect before you even go outside. You want to definitely use repellent. Mm -hmm. So that is something like an EPA registered uh, repellent. And also treat your, your clothing and your gear with permethrin. I think we have a, 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 yeah. a thing for folks. Um, you want to do long sleeves. You want to wear long pants. Tuck your pants into yeah. your socks. Avoid those wooded, high, grassy areas. Walk in the center of trails. Mm -hmm. When you come back in, shower right away. Mm -hmm. Shower, wash your clothes in, in high heat. Really mm -hmm. quickly before yeah. we let you get out of here, there's also some news this morning about a new drug that's been, treat that's been approved or about to be approved to treat alopecia. Yeah. A lot of folks mm -hmm. deal with this. Leads to hair loss. It's called alumetin. Al uh, alumiant. 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 Yeah. So this is really significant. About 300,000 people in this country have severe alopecia mm -hmm. and about a third of them would be candidates to be to be treated with this new drug. It's in a class of medications that's been around for actually quite a while oh. used to treat rheumatoid arthritis. And this one, alumiant, actually is used to treat some patients with severe COVID-19. Oh. A word to our viewers out there, it is an immunosuppressive medicine. So your doctor definitely has to review things that you need to be monitored mm -hmm. for and surveillance while on the medicine. But a huge boon for patients mm -hmm. who suffer with this cool. condition. Illuminate. Illuminate. Thank you, Dr. Azar. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Welcome back to you today. We got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it. Yeah. Hallie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now.
All right, we are wrapping up our series, Try This Today, with a look at some alternative methods of healing. And of course, always check with your doctor before trying something new. But I think this is so important. So here to walk us through integrative wellness is uh, integrative wellness expert, Dr. Taz Bhatia. Good morning to you. Good morning. These are all things that I think can, and it's not a prescription. Nope. It's not, these are just natural methods to, I think, help you thrive, in my opinion. Definitely. So let's start with an alternative uh, healing method. of It's called EFT tapping. Hoda introduced us to this. One. I know I'm so excited that she does this and you know this is all everything we're going to talk about today is about really managing stress and cortisol okay and things you can do at home they're super cheap you don't have to pay for them so face tapping comes from the world of Chinese medicine your face is a reflection of your entire body all okay. your emotions are stored there so there are key points throughout the face that help us to release emotions if we take advantage of it so the top of the head <laughs> you can start there you can go right above these eyebrows mm -hmm. right under the nose here is a powerful one right here under the eyes and even under the chin and the collarbone. You so, can. so, so, um, Dylan just asked you do it to yourself. I mean, Hoda did it yes. for uh, some of us. I noticed my shoulders went down. She said a little something as she did it, but I mean, is there a method can, to it or? There is a method and we can get super technical about it, but just start somewhere. And I would say about three to five seconds per point yeah. and go in about four or five rotations, spend about three to five minutes a day on it, doing it yourself. And you have an easy way to really bring the stress down. It centers down you, doesn't it? And release a lot of the emotions that we just trap. All right. You know, okay. all over. This is another one that I am a believer. And yes. you, I know you did this one as well recently. Yeah. Uh, so these these bowls are often used in sound baths. Is yes. that right? So so how does this how does this so work? So these are fun. So these basically use the power of sound and vibrational energy to bring cortisol down okay. and to help you really get into a relaxation and state. And what is cortisol? So cortisol is a stress hormone. Okay. Most of us are just doing this all the time, yes, right? So this is a way to bring it down, hmm. to calm the nervous system down a little bit. And the science behind it is using those overlapping vibrations to get you into that state. And it's so easy. Again, something you could do yourself. You just take the stick, hit it on the side. You can drag that sound out. And then you can also do overlapping vibrations. Mm. And how hard you go and where you go determines sort of what happens with the sound. That and so each cool. vibration has mm -hmm. some sort of effect on the body in terms of relaxing. Mm. And how down. long should you should you do this I one? mean, even five minutes a day can make a difference. Wow. Okay. And there's really neat studies here with uh, veterans and PTSD and how it really oh. made a difference That for seems them. really cool. Yeah. Okay. All right, dry brushing doesn't seem as relaxing because this brush is a little hard. Well, it has a method to its madness, okay. believe it or not. So the way dry brushing works is really to stimulate our lymphatic. Mm -hmm. Our lymphatics are so overlooked and so ignored, and they really mm -hmm. help us to detox, help us to move things around, improve our circulation. Mm -hmm. So this is simple. You take, you want a hard bristle brush okay. because you want to go in circular oh. motion, and you want to go kind of up and towards the heart because mm -hmm. that's what's improving like overall. And, and you do. Time. Actually, that's one of the purposes of oh. dry brushing is to help exfoliation, to improve circulation. There's some studies that show it breaks down cellulite too, but overall, oh. just <laughs> great <laughs> self-care sort of modality that you can use anywhere, use it in the shower, okay. again. But always on the today. arms or? Arms, no, you can, go, you can start at the bottom oh, okay. and go all oh, the way wow. up and come towards the heart and okay. come back out. So okay. it's a full body wellness. I can treatment. see this being something that calms you down. Yeah. Yeah. So Dr. Tez, I, I love you. You've got you, one of these I've in got your office. I've got one of these yes. in my office. Yes. 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 got them at home. Essential oils and vaporizers. I love this stuff. I have it everywhere. So essential oils. Now it works in a couple different ways. When <laughs> so that's not very calming, but that's okay. But when we're inhaling, Ooh, sound bath. <laughs> there we go. So when we're inhaling these oils, it's Sorry. actually traveling to the limbic system, which mm -hmm. is our emotional center in the brain. So what's happening, depending on the oil we're using, we're sort of getting an emotional response. So if you use lavender, for example, which I'm smelling right now, yeah. it helps with relaxation. Mm. There are others, some of the citrus oils that are energizing, mm -hmm. kind of get us up and going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When we use it topically, then they're absorbed through the skin and they work in a different way. So again, how easy is this, right? You can yeah. carry it around. You're having a stressful moment. It's a little Put dab. on your there, oh, right behind sniff, your ears. And you're good. Inhale. I love that. These and expensive? it's pretty. No, no, not at all. Yeah. Not at all. You can, no. And you can get I them just about anywhere. I think they're under $20. You can get them anywhere. Now, yeah. oh, this is wow. Dr. Tess. Yeah. Thank you so much.
You know, Candace, it's so hard to believe that you first met Bob Saget back when you were 10 years old. You're 45 now. It's been 35 years of knowing and loving Bob Saget. Do you remember the very first time you met him? I do remember. I, I do. We were doing our pilot episode for Full House and Bob is so tall. You know, he's 6'4". And I was 10 years old. I'm still not that much taller <laughs> than when I was 10, but, but he kneeled down to me and got eye to eye with me. And he said, hi, I'm Bob and I'm going to be your dad. I'm playing your dad. So I want you to feel comfortable and we're going to be friends. And he was just so warm and inviting. And I remember that as a kid, he made me feel instantly comfortable with him. And he was just so sweet. And it really kicked off an incredible 35 year friendship. Well, for you as a young actress to be able to be yourself, you have to be able to share like what's on your mind, what's on your heart. Mm -hmm. Was he a place that you could go to do that? He was. It's one, one of the things that made Bob so special. Bob was so vulnerable. He was so emotionally available all the time. And he was really the first person in my life as a man that I saw cry and have those emotions right at the forefront of his conversations. And he wasn't afraid of them. He wasn't embarrassed by them. And that's what made your connection with Bob so great. And that's what made mine so great with him because I felt so safe with him. And it was like, there wasn't anything that I couldn't say or share with him. And he would be right in that moment with you. If you were hurting, he would hurt with you. You would see the tears well up in his eyes. He would breathe with you. He just yeah, was an incredibly available, emotional person. I mean, that's so, I, I, I understand why you didn't forget the moment when you watch a grown man tear up in front of you. Do you remember mm -hmm. anything specific or do you just remember those emotions? Well, there's a, a lot that I remember because we've been friends for so long and, you know, Bob, Bob has dealt with so much death in his life with his sisters and his uncles and and his parents. So Bob was never afraid to talk about it and show it. And, you know, he always dealt with that in a, in a comedic way, but there was always so much sadness and hurt behind it. And that's how he handled it. So there were many times, I mean, I literally growing up with Bob and not just on television, but we were friends. Like Bob is my whole, not only childhood, but my my teenage years, I mean, we used to go to Jerry's Deli all the time and we just drive around and listen to music. And sometimes we'd have those conversations, like he would just like feel his sister's presence. And we would just sit and feel that, you know, Bob is a remarkable person. And um, I, I just, I've never had a friendship like the one I've had with him. And it, that's what, why it makes it so hard. <laughs> you said Bob is a remarkable person. You talk about him like he's here still. I can't, I, I can't believe he's gone forever. I just can't. I, my, my brain has not um, comprehended that yet. Um, you know, I think for, for even TV viewers, again, you might think like, oh, he, he played your dad on TV, but Bob was so much more than that. I mean, really one of my closest friends for 35 years. So to, to think that um, he's not here and we're not going to have that last, you know, another joke or another hug or um, just another bit of ridiculousness in life is, is, um, Oh, it's almost unbearable for me to think about. What did you lose when he passed? Um, Bob was available and there for everyone that he knew. 
But Bob, Bob was that person that no matter what happened, Bob would drop anything for you in a second, in a heartbeat. And you didn't even have to be his best friend for him to do that. I mean, that's how huge his heart was. But when, you know, being someone that was very close to him, losing him it, it is, um, he, I, I don't selfishly, I just think he's just, he, he was just someone that you could count on and would love you no matter what, and just, and be there. And so that's, there are very few friends in life like that. And that is the hardest part of the loss is just that, that friendship that's unconditional that, mm. I mean, it's, it's mm. a lifetime, but I guess our lifetime is, you know, finished on earth <laughs> for now. For now. It's a good way to end that at least for now. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. It's funny because when I watched John Mayer break down, and I watched John Stamos, and I watched you, and I watched all these people in his life, I don't think America realized just how many people he cut. The number of people who have come out, the tributes, the beautiful uh, fundraising events that are going on. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've seen this in my lifetime with someone in Hollywood that is so universally loved and cared for. And it, you know, it just, it just struck me he was all that, wasn't he? He really was all that. It is remarkable to me. I mean, I've always known how special he is, his close friends do, but Bob was friends with everyone and, and from, from all walks of life. Mm -hmm. And so to see so many people coming together, I'm glad that the world is getting to hear how much more there was to Bob um, he was a great humanitarian. He tirelessly raised money for Scleroderma uh, Research Foundation over the years. He, again, he would drop anything for anyone. And he just had a heart of gold. Mm -hmm. And on top of it, he made you laugh. Like he was just, it was the best combination of, of all different traits that you could imagine together. And that was Bob. You know, you remember the first time you met him, and I wonder what was the last communication you had with him? Um, it was just a few, just two weeks before he passed. I'm actually going to grab my, my phone. <laughs> I'm so scared that I'm going to pull up his text and then accidentally delete it one day. Like it scares me so much because I don't ever want to lose this. But um, Bob and I talked just a couple weeks before 
he passed and um, <laughs> we were going to have dinner and we got into a little tiff and his flight was delayed. We ended up not having dinner, but in, in Bob fashion, the next day he wrote me like what would be pages long of a text. And he was apologizing, saying he was cranky and he was just so, he was just so sorry. And um, he said, oh, now I feel even worse. I was so wrong. You're like my favorite person on the earth. And I acted like Dolly. I was getting ready to take a late flight and I was annoyed. Dolly was his mom. And he said, you're one of the few that understands that if I act like Dolly, I'm not the best at my game that day. Ha ha. And Bob went on and on and on in the text. And he said at the end, I love you more. I love you more. Um, for sure. I love you more for the trouble you're giving me, if that's even possible. And I wrote back, I love you. I could never be mad at you. Roll my eyes at you, yes, but never mad. And I love that you being Dolly, that made me laugh out loud. I loved your mom. And he just wrote back, I loved you. My mom loved you too. When you start things in life and have <laughs> are very important pieces. And that's yeah. a beautiful, beautiful last exchange. I love your sweatshirt. Everyone's talking about your sweatshirt. It says, what, love like Jesus, hug like Bob? Bob Is that right? Sackett. Bob Sackett. Okay, brilliant. A, B, like, uh, it's raising money, isn't it? It is actually. I just designed the sweatshirt selfishly. For, for me, I for Kelly, for, I, I made 10 of them. And, um, you know, I don't think there's a, a person that can showcase love for the world more than Jesus. But Bob gave the best hugs ever. So those are like the two that have been put on the pedestal for me. Love like Jesus and a hug like Bob Saget. And it, it, a bunch of people said, oh, can I get one? Can I get one? So I teamed up with the shop forward and all the proceeds, 100% of them have gone to the Scleroderma Research Foundation. And we've raised over $200,000 so far. Wow. Yeah. One sweatshirt that you that you got for you and Kelly and the rest. That's amazing. I know. He, you know, I think it was such a shock to everybody when he passed. Did he, and since you were in more communication with him than most, did he seem like healthy, okay? Like I think everyone yes. was Yes. I mean, as I said, we he was he was on the road doing a stand-up. He was just loving it, was healthy, was fine. And yeah, Bob just also was not didn't complain in that way. He just was going and he was on a roll. That's why it was so shocking mm -hmm. because he had done the show that night. I mean, what a way to go in that sense. He, he, he left us, but he had just finished what he loved doing two hours of stand up, which is almost unheard of. He had like an extra long night because he, it was just going so well. Mm -hmm. And that was it. You know, I, that's why it was so, it was so shocking to all of us because there were no there were any signs of that anything would be wrong. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark how long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. Allie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? 
name is Lester. Man, who's this? Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at eight on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Hamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Was he proud of your career? <laughs> Bob was so proud of my career. He really was. He was a big cheerleader for me. I mean, I know now as a parent, when you watch someone grow up from a child to an adult and see what they've done, he was so incredibly supportive. And that's what was so awesome about Bob because we had this close friendship. And, you know, if people see Bob stand up, they, you know, he has a different side to him in his stand-up. It's not family-friendly stand-up. And so that would always be a question, like, how, how can you guys be friends? And it's like, well, I grew up with Bob, so I understand his sense of humor. I, too, have a sense of humor. <laughs> but I can also separate that person that's, you know, on the stage making jokes to get the laugh and the real heart behind a person and their love and their friendship and their kindness. And, and so Bob was so wonderful in that way and supportive of me and, and yet would tell me like, he would invite me to things all the time in the stand-up world, but then say, you're invited, but don't come. <laughs> don't come because I know you, this will like cross a line for you. You're not going to enjoy it. You're not going to laugh. So like, I love you. You can come if you want to, but don't come. Brilliant. Brilliant. And that's like a, what a real friend does. Just lastly, Candace, I know he was proud of your career. We all follow your career. I know you always have another project in the hopper. So are you working on something right now? What do you have that's coming out? I have another Aurora Tea Garden mystery that is airing on February 20th. This is our 18th movie in the franchise. I'm shocked. <laughs> yeah, it's been a lot. That's on the Hallmark Movies and Mysteries channel. And the special thing about this one is called Haunted by Murder. These are all family friendly, by the way. Yeah. You can watch them with your kids, but this is about a haunted house and my daughter is actually in this movie and Lexa Doig who plays my best friend in the series her daughter is also in this movie and the two of them are playing us our characters as teenagers okay. so we have some flashbacks and it's like it's amazing <laughs> it's oh, really fun. That, that is awesome Candace thank you so much what a beautiful and tender tribute uh, to Bob boy Thank you for sharing. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Hoda. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. we got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Yeah. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. 
To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. In the wake of the sudden passing of beloved comedian Bob Saget, friends and fans and colleagues have been sharing countless stories of his remarkable kindness and generosity. But for the first time now, we're about to hear from the person who knew him best recently and really just maybe loved him the most. I Although think there's so. a good competition for that. I'd say so. Kelly Rizzo, what a wonderful, wonderful human being. I got a chance to share an emotional conversation with Kelly. While she says this is the most difficult time in her life, she also says it's also easy to know what her mission will be moving forward. She says it's spreading Bob's legacy of love and laughter. Kelly, first of all, I just want to say the entire country feels like we're holding your hands, your collective hands. I want to know just how you're doing today. Well, I was just telling some of my family that today's a little bit, there's a little bit more of a sense of calm. I think you get to a point where your body will just physically not let you cry anymore, or at least all day. Still, every second is is horrible, but you start to come to terms with it a little bit. Six years ago, Bob Saget and Kelly Rizzo, a food and travel blogger from Chicago, met after connecting on Instagram. Married since 2018, friends say they had a love for the ages. I'm watching you and you're sitting in your home that you shared with with Bob, and I just wondered if you're remembering all the the little things, if that pops up. Well, it's impossible here not to, but the support has been, that, that has been the one silver lining from this, is the incredible outpouring of love and support, not only from just everybody that loved Bob, but also for me and just from his friends and family, it's been, I don't know how else I'd be getting through this right now. The number of people, Kel, who loved Bob is just, I, I can't even quantify. I heard someone say that Bob was an I love you guy. He put it all out there. He told everyone that he loved. And I mean, quite frankly, anyone he met and even spent any time with at all, he told them he loved them endlessly and tirelessly. And that was his entire message. If you knew Bob, and he loved you, you knew it. There was never, ever a doubt in your mind. I mean, even at his at, at his memorial, there were a lot of people there and every single person was pretty much like, oh, I talked to Bob last week. I'm like, hmm. how did he have the time hmm. to talk to everybody and tell everybody that he loved them all the time? It was just amazing. We had an interview with, with Mike Young, who's, you know, a comedian and dear friend of Bob's. He said something, Kel, that struck um, struck me. He said, most comedians, after a stand-up gig, they catch the last flight home. He said, not Bob. Bob wanted to catch the first flight home. He wanted to be with you, Kelly. And he said that that their love was, was perfect. Yeah. Sorry. Um, that was what was always so special is every time he would be out of town, he would always try to, he would, you know, he would work so hard and he, um, you know, he'd love to sleep in, but when he was away, he would always try to, he would still wake up at, you know, go to bed at two and then wake up at four so he could be on the 6 a.m. flight so he could come home just so we could spend time together. So, you know, he valued every single second that we had together. So that's why it's, you know, this is so heartbreaking but at the same time i know that we you know every second that we had together was just maximized to the fullest and we absolutely just there was nothing you know left unsaid and nothing left on the table mm -hmm. so those are the things that i'm just trying to hold on to you know you know i feel like everyone felt like they knew bob because everyone mm -hmm. grew up watching him or P or even young kids now were watching him again on tv but uh, Kel, who was the Bob Saget like at dinner when there was no audience? It was still the same. And he just tried to make everybody feel special and happy and comfortable. And it's funny, like our, our dry cleaners, he has, I always joke that he had a deeper relationship with them than he had with anybody, you know, like they love him. 
and he loved them. And his constant message was just treat everybody with kindness because, you know, he'd gone through so much in his life and he knew how hard life could be. And so he always was just so kind and loving to everybody. And he was just, I'm sorry, he was just such a, he was just the best man I've ever known in my life. And he was just so kind and so wonderful. And everybody that was in his life knew it. <laughs> and even anybody that would just casually meet him was like, wow, this is a special guy. And he was yours. And by all accounts, he was living his best life. Did you think he was feeling okay during, during all this time? All I'll say is that he was very happy and he was just thrilled to be back out on the road. And he was also very sensitive and just all the weight of everything going on in the world right now. He, it was just weighing very heavily on him. And that's mm. why he felt more compelled than ever to make people laugh and bring people together. And he did it up until the very last moments. You know, we've all lost someone in our life. And sometimes you hang on to the last text, the last conversation, <laughs> the last connection. Is that, is that Kel, the case with you? I'm just very grateful that it was all I love you so much. Mm -hmm. It was, I think I said, I love you dearly. And he said, I love you endlessly. And then he mm -hmm. said, I said, I can't wait to see you tomorrow. And then, you know, it was just all very, it was just all love. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's, that is, that's beautiful, Kel. Um, when we were seeing the images of everyone saying goodbye at the funeral, is there anything that you feel comfortable sharing about what it was like? Were you able to speak? I don't think I'll get too much into it, but I did speak and it was just the whole thing as painful as it was, was beautiful to be surrounded by so many people who loved him and who loved each other. I can't even verbalize the level of support. I'm so grateful for it. One of the things that he was very passionate about was uh, scleroderma that took his sister Gay's life. And one of the most beautiful things of this was n nobody said hey, everybody go donate to scleroderma in Bob's honor. But do you know what everyone did? They donated. They, they to did it. Bob was dedicated to finding a cure for scleroderma, an autoimmune disease that took his sister's life. The Scleroderma Research Foundation estimates that Bob raised more than $26 million for the SRF in his lifetime. He had three life's works. One was his children, next was comedy, and then the SRF. He spent over 30 years wow. tirelessly working so hard to try to find a cure for scleroderma. So that's why anything that I can do to help keep that legacy going and just help with the SRF because it meant so much to him. As I'm sitting here reflecting and sitting with you is that Bob spent his life and he sort of united people just by being himself. He wasn't trying. And in his passing, he's doing it again. I've never seen anything like this. It's it's unbelievable. The just the outpouring, mm -hmm. but the consensus overall of what an amazing person he was, whether people knew him or didn't know him, because mm -hmm. one way or another, he was in your living room since the eighties, yeah. or you know, you went to his shows. I mean, whatever it is, it was. Um, he felt like he was everyone's you know dear friend. Nobody will ever be like Bob. And I think he just kind of lived his life unafraid, which is what struck me. He found love again in his 60s. He told his friends, I love you. He was back on stage. Like the guy was fearless. And I think that's what struck me about it. And she loved all parts of him. But, and even, you know, on stage, he had that, like that raunchy side. She yeah. was like, but that yeah. was part of him. <laughs> yeah. He wasn't afraid. No, he's truthful. Yeah, he you really know? told the truth. It's just like, it just is so moving. I hope it's comforting to her that everyone, so many people just mm -hmm. feel so connected to him and are just missing him and loving him. And what a wonderful legacy to leave. Well, one of the things that's become obvious over the last couple of weeks is Bob Saget was a special guy. Mm -hmm. Kelly? Yeah. Also pretty special. Amazingly special. Yeah. And Bob made friendships late in life. You saw John Mayer just mm -hmm. sobbing after Bob passed. And you just thought, like, wow. He kept, he, his circle kept yeah. getting bigger and bigger.
Well, hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to a brand new Pop Star Plus. On the show today, our buddy Isaac Fitzgerald has a new book, and he's telling us all about it. It's really great. That's coming up. Plus, did you hear the new Father of the Bride movie? It's drawn to a huge response at HBO Max's audience. We'll tell you what we know about that. And also, we've got an interview with the entire cast of that for you. But last, and certainly not least, we're celebrating the great Danny Glover ahead of his birthday this week with a throwback clip from one of his most beloved films, of course, Lethal Weapon. But first, here's today's pop star headlines. First up, we teased it earlier, Bruce Springsteen. You've heard of Boss Baby. Well, how about Boss Grandpa? It's a new era of glory days for the rock and roll icon thanks to the addition of his very first grandchild Bruce's son Sam Springsteen his partner recently gave birth to a little Lily Harper Springsteen Aww. and over the weekend Bruce's wife Patty shared a few snaps of the beautiful baby girl and the new parents on social media and this morning we are sending a huge congratulations out to the Springsteens Amen. that is awesome from one Bruce to another next up we're talking about Bruce Willis uh. in honor of Die Hard's anniversary this week the action movie star is remembering this famous scene Awesome. I promise I will never even think about going up in a tall building again. Oh, God, please don't let me die. That's such a great oh. It turns out Bruce did, in fact, go back up that tall building again to celebrate 34 years since John McClane jumped from the Nakatomi Plaza roof. He returned to the scene of the crime in a video posted by Bruce's wife, Emma. The actor is seen standing on what now is actually the Fox Building roof in Century City, California. The video is cut together with black and white throwback clips from the movie. Wow. So now it seems like a good time maybe just to reignite that debate. Is oh, Die Hard a Christmas go. movie Oh, there we or go. Not? You Absolutely. know where he stands. Absolutely. And, why, and what's your reason uh, again? It takes place at Christmas. Christmas. It's a Christmas, it's a Christmas party. party. It's, come on. It's Christmas. There you go. Did you, you, go. Did you know that was a debate? Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. I did. Every year we talk about it. Never resolved it. I see you're thrilled about talking about that. Well, I just said that's not uh, next up, Andrew Garfield, the actor, may be flying high into his next big role. According to Deadline, the award-winning actor is oh. in line to play Richard Branson in a new series about the entrepreneur. It's called Hot Air. It comes from Deadpool 2, 2 director David Leach and is based on the book Dirty Tricks. It's a six-episode miniseries set to tell the story of the famous billionaire behind Virgin Airways. And for Andrew Garfield, things are looking good in the world of TV as well because just last week, the Spider-Man actor was nominated for his first mm -hmm. Emmy thanks to his part in FX's Under the Banner of Heaven. No word yet on when production for the Branson Project is scheduled to kick off. And here's a few more headlines for you. It is Popstar Plus, after all. There's nothing we love seeing more than Ryan Reynolds and his lovely wife, Blake Lively, troll each other on the internet. And in his latest ad for Mint Mobile, the Deadpool star is doing just that. Take a look. It's hard to believe Mint's new family plan is just $15 a month per person. So I've asked my wife and plan member to back me up. You're not my wife. No, I just stand in for her on set during the boring stuff. The boring stuff? I'm literally revolutionizing the category. Yeah, she owes me huge for this one. Can you please let her know I'm upset? Really? No. <laughs> Naturally, Blake was quick to respond. The actress joked, darling, if you charge more, you could afford me. And then followed that up with, my love, feel free to revolutionize the couch when you sleep on it tonight. All right, those guys are great. Finally, John Mulaney on Saturday, the Chicago native took the mic at Wrigley Field, but instead of doing a stand-up set, Mulaney got to lead the Cubs crowd in that famous seventh inning stretch. Take a look. That must be amazing if you're from Chicago and you get to do that. I, I can't think of anything more iconic for somebody from Chicago. Mulaney's partner, as you saw there, Olivia Munn, pulling the ultimate proud girlfriend uh, move. She was recording from the stands, and maybe if the whole stand-up thing doesn't work out, maybe John could uh, take a shot on the voice. You guys have got a good voice. All right, that's all we've got for you today. Still coming up, our friend Isaac Fitzgerald's latest book. He's not going to tell you about somebody else's book. This time, it's his own book coming up. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app.
the day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. It's a can't-miss summer on today. They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. we got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody good, and that's it! Yeah. Welcome back to Popstar Plus. You know, we love Isaac Fitzgerald around here. He's told us about so many great books, but today we're stoked to share that he has his own book, and he spoke to us this morning about his own memoir called Dirtbag, Massachusetts. Take a look. For years, our viewers have watched Isaac Fitzgerald. He recommends books, and as Carson says, he makes non-readers want to read. Well, he not only recommends books, he writes them. And this project has people talking. It is raw. It is a revealing memoir. It's called Dirtbag Massachusetts. It's all about the many lives he's lived to become the man we all know and love. Hi, Isaac. Hi, Hoda. Thank you so much for having me on. It's I so am, good to see you. I am so, I mean, I always looked at you a certain way when you came here as this enthusiastic, <laughs> bubbly, effervescent guy. I actually didn't know how it all began. Yeah. And to read from the very beginning that you uh, you viewed yourself as a little boy coming into this world, and I guess you would have said the words, I am a mistake. Yep. That's I am absolutely a mistake. Right. Yep. Tell me about that. I mean, listen, when you're a child growing up in the situation that I grew up in, and the, was, the situation yeah. was my parents were married when they had me just to different people. Yeah. And from a very early age, I viewed myself as a bomb that exploded their lives. And that was something that I cared, carried with me for a very, very long time, which meant that I really was undervaluing myself. I really saw myself as basically a troublemaker, somebody that took these two families, their separate families, yeah. and then blew them up. And that was an incredibly hard thing to work through. But that's what this book is about. It's about my very tough childhood, but then also about how I reacted to that childhood. And for years and years, there was wildness. There was a lot of things, like you said, yeah. that you would not have known no. because I would not share them publicly. And then it's about the therapy. It's about coming back together as a family. So that's the arc of this book, and that's the journey I've been on. We talk about what happened, and you're, in your childhood, it was difficult. I mean, yeah. there was violence. There was poverty. Yeah. You went through hell and back. Yeah. And I keep thinking, like, but you did say the one thing your parents gave you was books. You always had books. And this is an interesting question, but without books in your life, mm. if they had not introduced those yeah. to you, who would I be talking to today? Let me tell you, I've, this is something that I like to say, which is I think I'd still be in my, I grew up in the inner city Boston, but eventually we made our way to rural north central Massachusetts. I think I would probably still be in that town. Don't get me wrong. I think I would still have my bubbly, energetic you self. Would? I do. I really think I would have, but I think I'd, you know, I never would have had dreams or ambitions. What books gave me was a map out of the life that I was living and towards something larger and more spectacular. And because of that, that gift that my parents gave me, they were struggling in so many different ways on their own. But the one thing they gave me was this love of books. And through that, through reading, I was able to find a different life. And that just, you know, it's something that I still treasure about them. We have a very complicated relationship, but I know that they gave me that gift. And, and in a way, this book is for them. To think that you went through all the things you went through as a young boy, and I was just imagining your mom reading the book. There's, again, there are things about abuse. She talked about how she was contemplating an abortion. She told you that when you were eight. Mm -hmm. She slapped you on the stomach and said, if you weren't so fat, maybe I wouldn't have to keep buying you clothes. Things like that. You hand her this book. Mm -hmm. She reads it. 
What was the first thing she said? She wrote me a letter that I've probably been waiting for my entire life mm -hmm. without even knowing. And the first thing she said was, I'm sorry. <laughs> and that was incredible. To just receive that was so incredible. Because this book for me, I didn't want it to be a tidy ending. And I'm not going to give away too much here. But it's an ongoing conversation. Yeah. And so to hand it to her, have her actually take the time to read it, which she didn't have to do. And I told her that. Mm -hmm. But she took the time to read it, take it in, to write me a letter that said, I'm sorry. And then the next line was even more freeing in a mm -hmm. way. What she said was, I had no idea you were carrying this. I had no idea you were carrying this. And that's when you realize, as a child, those years were most of my life. That's, it felt so difficult and so hard because it was everything. Mm -hmm. Those years for her were a hard section of her already long life. Your, that was your whole life. That was my whole your life, whole and it was life. just her, that section. So I think for her, she then did see me become this bubbly, effervescent, to use your words, person. So she was like, okay, he's gotten through it. And she t for her to say, I had no idea you were carrying this, I'm so sorry, just meant the world to me. This book, Isaac, has everything. You're, you seem to be searching for your way home. And just in the last few seconds, we have. Yeah. Did you find your way? A hundred percent. This is this. That is what this book is about. Is it about a family that explodes apart, but then in a very different shape, but a still beautiful shape comes back together? Can I tell you, if you pick up this book and you should Dirtbag Massachusetts, you will not put it down. Isaac, I thought I knew you. And now I really know you. Thank you so much. He's a really incredible guy, and that seems like an amazing story. Huge thanks to Isaac for the sneak peek. He signed a copy for me, too. I can't wait to read it. All right, up next, how Chloe Feynman channeled Martin Short in the new Father of the Bride remake. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Yeah, who's this? Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Man, who's this? To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Hamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to Popstar Plus. There's a new Father of the Bride movie out, and it's already gathered up a record on HBO Max after its release over Father's Day weekend. It had the biggest audience for a streaming-only film on the service. The film provides a new twist on the original movie, and the cast filled us in on all the fun. I would describe this version of Father of the Bride as uh, a remake, but it's not exactly like the two other versions of this. And it's the first time I, I've, I've seen a Hollywood movie with two different cultures, you know, a Mexican and a Cuban-American wedding. That's what sets this movie apart. It's very authentic to both cultures. It's very specific, while at the same time being very universally themed, you know, very relatable for everyone. It's fun. It's such yeah. a fun movie. I really think that it 
stands on its own really well. You don't have to have watched the other Father of the Brides to really understand it. I have something to say. I'm engaged. Oh. Congratulations, uh, And I propose. Wow. You propose? You propose? Oh, sorry. You propose? Yes. You proposed to him. Mm -hmm. He didn't propose to you. Mm -hmm. Can you do that? Does anyone do that? I think that the Latin cast will be mainly a flavor of the movie because the central theme is really about how hard it is for the older generations to keep up with the changes happening in these times. For me, that theme feels like something that should speak across all cultures. And I kind of hope that most people, regardless of what ethnicity or or race they're from, they can say like, yeah, that's my dad. And hopefully people with opposing points of views can still sit together and break bread and enjoy. Two lawyers are out of college, working for a nonprofit, they're gonna pay for the wedding. Billy! I'm the father of the bride and I will be paying for the wedding and I'm gonna be walking my daughter down the aisle. Andy Arcia and Gloria Stefan are like Miami royalties and they're the best of friends. So they were the perfect fit for this roles because, you know, everyone knows who they are and it just felt like this movie was made for them. To have the privilege of having Gloria there with me as an old longtime friend and of course admirer of hers, but the fact that we have a relationship, our families have relationships, it's easy to, to sit and they go, okay, now we're this, and just lose yourself in this imaginary circumstance, but bring all our dynamic that we have in our friendship and in our own marriages that are that can feed the, this this relationship and this particular couple, you know. I think the best way to describe it is is like having your dream family to work with. I did channel Martin Short's frockness in the sense of uh, there's like a looseness and a hilariousness and a freedom to Martin Short as a performer and especially in this movie. And I think obviously this is a very modern interpretation of what a wedding planner is. But yeah, I think that I was inspired by Martin Short in the sense of like bringing a lot of improv and just kind of like riffing a lot on set and having the freedom to do that. And a lot of that made it into the movie, which I was like, whoa, okay. <laughs> Give me essay as Anna Mara Vera Wang and Uzuhar Murad. I think what's so beautiful about both of our characters is their fortitude to just get the job done. You know, they both just get it done and then surprise themselves. And I think you really can like be or do anything these days. And um, I think our characters should be inspiration. Yeah, I think, in, especially when it comes to personal life, like with family and stuff, I think it's it's okay to really solidify yourself as the as the outsider and embrace it and, and not be scared to go your own way. Everyone, I think culturally, universally, we're all incredibly different, both as humans and even as cultures, but we are surprisingly the same and we all want the same things. So yes, it's a story about two Latin American families sort of clashing and then coming together, but it's still so universal. I think everybody will be able to relate with a, a character or will be able to relate with different situations. Well, I think that despite our diverse cultures, Latino cultures, because we're all very different, the Mexican from the Cuban, there are things that tie us such as the love for extended family that is exemplified in this film. You don't see that in any of the other ones. The music, the food, the dancing, the celebratory nature that we share. You know, but we're still in the struggle of having our children growing up in a different time and, and having different ways of wanting to be and different ways of wanting to celebrate their love stories. Happy. Ready? Yes, and you? No. Get ready to think, get ready to dance, get ready to laugh, and maybe shed cry, one or two yeah. tears. All right, very cool. Hey, guys, still coming up, we're going to take a classic look back at Lethal Weapon with the legendary Danny Glover. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to you today. we got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Yeah. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. 
live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Welcome back. We are thinking of Danny Glover as he comes up on his 76th birthday. Of course, you have to remember, maybe you're too young, but the buddy cop film Lethal Weapon came out in 1987. This year marked 35 years since its release. So we thought it'd be fun to do a little throwback now to when Danny came to visit us here and talked all about playing homicide detective Robert Murtaugh. In addition to his significant role as a villainous detective in Witness, Danny Glover has scored as a cowboy in Silverado. What a scene that was. A field hand in Places in the Heart, his powerful portrayal of Mr. in The Color Purple, and now Danny Glover stars with Mel Gibson in the action-packed thriller Lethal Weapon. Good morning. Good morning. It's an action-packed thriller, but it's more than that. Why did you do this movie? What attracted you to Lethal Weapon? Uh, one thing was the best script that I read. The second thing, the relationships, what was happening with the family and the relationship with Mel, and I dearly wanted to work with Mel Gibson, you know. I'm an admirer of his, and I, I love his work. So you, you knew of Mel Gibson through his work, but what was your reaction when you saw him, when you met him for the first time? Well, we, we met in the airport at Venice, uh, at the Venice Film Festival, and I kind of suggested, well, I said, I'd like to work with you. And oh, he, yeah? But it's, it's something so, um, so very nice about Mel. Uh, it's, it's unpretentious, and it's just real easy. So he said, yeah, I'd like to work with you, too. <laughs> and then it happened. It happened. Well, we didn't know it was going to happen. Yeah. I mean, this was six months uh, before, we, before I received the script, you know. But, uh, On the Today Show, uh, Richard Donner, the director, said that you both read for him in his house the it was, script. It was funny. We, we read the entire script. I mean, and we played, I would play my wife, and I would say, you know, I'd play my wife's role, <laughs> I'd play the kid's role, that. you know, I'd play the kid's, daddy, 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 daddy. <laughs> you know, it was just fun. It was so fun. And it's just, and Mel would play some of the roles, he would play some of the heavy roles, you know, and some of the cops' roles and whatever. And it's just fun reading and playing and have that kind of fun. And it went from that point on throughout the entire film, throughout the entire film, it went that way. Well, you and, you and uh, Mel Gibson are cops. And you're in a, in a murder case, and you're investigating the death of this uh, blonde girl. And that's the crux of it. But the real movie is the relationship between you two guys. Yeah. And as you say, there's a real relationship. Yeah. Now, in the movie, he's kind of crazy and young and wild. Yeah. And you play a 50-year-old man. But you weren't yeah. 50 years old. I mean, you were 38, 39 years old. Yeah, 30, So, so how'd you play a 50-year-old man? Um, I'm approaching 40, so it's pretty easy. I mean, your body changes. You know that. And it's hard to accept. So I use that as my, my stepping, my beginning, the acceptance of getting old, getting older. I mean, I started remembering, it's easier for me to remember when I'm 20 now than it was when I was 30 and remembering 20. You know, really? you, remember, you start to reminisce and you say the body doesn't function the same way as it used to function. So I use that and, and you, you notice it, you know. You spread a little bit, you know. And you get a bit, little bit too old for stuff. You feel good too. Well, here you are, this 50-year-old sergeant, you're dedicated, you're skilled, you're a civilized person, and suddenly you're told you have a new partner, yeah. Mel Gibson, but not what you expected. Hey, Raj, uh, you, know, you look Sample younger Sample with the beard. Three, three. Thanks, Captain. Lieutenant oh, Sample, yeah. Three, three, you shave the beard. Some detective. <laughs> Got two more things. Shoot. First. Condition of the sheets in the mattress indicate that someone else was in the bed with Amanda just before she died. That's A. What's B? B is, I'm supposed to tell you, you're breaking in a new partner in on this. Partner again? Yeah, some cat he's on loan from dope. Real burnout on the ragged edge. Oh, perfect. Gun! Hey, Raj, meet your new partner. Too old for this. <laughs> that 
That's a recurring line in the movie. You keep saying I'm too old for this as you have to do these crazy stunts. Do you have to get in physical shape to do this movie? Yes. Learn uh, how to shoot a gun? Yes, learn how to shoot a gun. We spent almost two months working daily with a trainer. And I mean, there's one thing about using a gun. You can pick up a gun, but it's, it's something else attached to that use of the gun. There's an attitude that you have to have. So we did everything. Man. We, we, we started out doing half loads and then full loads we would come in and take a house and it was real it was real i mean it was a real challenge it was real tense in a sense too eight years ago you were driving a yellow cab in san francisco eight uh, nine years ago eight, eight years ago right now i was driving a yellow cab in san francisco yeah. how how long ago does it seem does it seem longer than eight years ago is it a different world a different life what's happened well I, I don't think my life has changed uh considerably uh that's I mean, why you still wear the coin thing on your belt <laughs> <laughs> I, I was a hell of a uh, cab driver. Were you? I was some kind of cab driver. What I, makes a good cab driver? I mean, persistence. It's the same. It's not unlike acting. I mean, you just say, I'm going to make this, I'm going to do this, and you just push. And I would get up at 4 in the morning, start at 4, work to 2, and sometimes I would have an audition out in Los Angeles, and, and flights then were like $15, and I would fly down to Los Angeles, fly back. It was just crazy, but I was doing, I was acting. I was doing what I was wanted to do, supposed to do, Plus, I was paying the rent. Let me ask you a question about a different movie that you were in that caused a lot of discussion in the country, mm -hmm. and that is the role of Mr. in The Color Purple. Looking back on that movie now, are you glad you made the movie? Do you think that you were in any way misunderstood in that movie? Absolutely glad. I, I, I wouldn't change one thing that I did with that movie. Uh, and, I've, and all along, throughout that dispute, throughout all, throughout all the discussion and discourse, I felt the same thing. When I read the book, uh, which I love dearly, I thought and felt that Alice Walker loved black men, that her book was a contribution out of love. And I still feel the same way I felt in 1982, at the end of 1982 when I read the book, and I feel right now at the beginning of 1987. Danny Glover, I wanted to meet you for a long time. You're a really good actor, and I hope your career continues to rise and rise and rise. Thank you. Congratulations on Lethal Weapon. Thank you very much. All that and Danny Glover would go on to star in four more Lethal Weapon films. That was a fun throwback there. An early happy birthday goes out to you, Mr. Glover. All right, that's going to do it for Pop Star Plus today. Another fine edition. We'll be back tomorrow. Hope you can join us. Until then, have a great day. Welcome to Today All Day. All day? Today All Day. All day. This is a long oh, way of man. asking yeah, who's your okay. favorite character you've ever oh, played? The right. unicorn. The unicorn. You gotta have the unicorn. <laughs> What is she right there? That's why you're saying all these nice things? Yeah, she gave me the, the look. Sorry to disturb your day. Everyone's mad at you, Willie. Better make this fast. I don't want the wrath of Luna. When I see you, I always think, I wonder what his quote would be. Give us six minutes and we'll ask as many questions as we can. Welcome to Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. My buddy Cal cooking with me. That's no babysit. It's called parenting. What was the first book you remember loving? Heart Smart Today, with simple exercises to strengthen your heart. Make the most of your beach days. It's all about the tracksuit oh, now. How wow. good do they look? I now pronounce you husband and wife. Kiss the bride. This morning, a story of people helping people. You received tons of letters from people who have been inspired. Let's do the weather out. <laughs> OK. All you got to do is say, it's cold, it's warm, it's raining, it's snowing. That's it. One of our most favorite yes. franchises ever, Ambush Makeover. Oh, OK. <laughs> look at it. It doesn't, it doesn't look so good. No, it doesn't look good. <laughs> will you judge okay. us in a cook-off? I yeah. will. And okay. you guys will definitely win something. Today, all day. All day? All day. Welcome to Today, All Day.
Hello, hello, happy Monday. It's Today All Day, hope you had a good one, and we are so glad you joined us for it Today in 30. And this is our digital show, you guys know it by now. Today in 30, packed with everything you need to see from this morning show, and we put it in a mere 30 minutes. Yeah, how do we do that? We got a lot to cover too, including this scathing new report highlighting systemic failures in the Uvalde school shooting response. We're gonna have the latest on that and the new outrage voiced by the families overnight. Also ahead, Joe Fryer has details on Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's visit to New York City today. It's the couple's first public outing since the Queen's Jubilee. And then our resident shark expert, Carrie Sanders, is at it again, hitting the seas in search of sharks. Wait you see what's drawing young great whites closer to shore. And then if you're still brave enough to hit the beach, Jill Martin has a conversation with the founder of a swimwear brand loved by celebs and made for all types of women. Her message, everybody has a bikini body. Well, that's interesting. We'll stay tuned for that one coming up on <laughs> Today, Today in 30. 30. NBC Sam Brock leads us off on a Monday morning. He is in Uvalde for us. Sam, good morning. Savannah Hoda, good morning. Every time you think this couldn't get any worse, it does. That report talks about systemic failures. Three unlocked doors on the exterior of the building. As you said, Savannah, nearly 400 law enforcement officers who were here that day in Wi-Fi connectivity that was so poor some of the alerts to teachers were delayed. Now we're getting a look at body cam footage, horror, inside of those hallways. And we have to warn you, the images are disturbing. <laughs> For the first time, the public is getting a chilling picture of early moments inside Rob Elementary from police body camera footage. Am I bleeding? Am I bleeding? Am I bleeding? Early chaos and glimpses of calls to action. We gotta get in there. The is in the we gotta get in there. He just keeps shooting. That plea coming minutes after the massacre began. But that first interaction, the only time the officers are seen in the video physically confronting the gunman for well over an hour. At one point, Uvalde School District Sir. Police Chief Peter Redondo seen trying to reason with the shooter. Let me know if there's any kids in there or anything. This could be peaceful. Arredondo, who's on administrative leave, maintains he was not the incident commander that day. This new footage released as the most comprehensive report to date conducted by the Texas House finds law enforcement, which ultimately reached 376 officers, didn't honor their most basic responsibility. The author's writing, they failed to prioritize saving the lives of innocent victims over their own safety. Several officers in the hallway or in that building knew or should have known there was dying in that classroom and they should have done more, acted with urgency. Family members said they were hoping for more than a verbal dressing down. But they're saying we already knew it. They were powered. Ultimately, some action was taken right away. The city's mayor announcing right before this meeting, the acting chief of Uvalde's police department, Mariano Pargas, now on administrative leave. The report signing no evidence that any officer who did learn about 911 phone calls coming from inside rooms 111 and 112, including Pargas, acted on it to advocate shifting to an active shooter style response. There are also windows into heroism. Go, let's get these kids out of here, let's get these kids out of here. Students apparently being pulled out of the building and this heartbreaking hallway exchange with Officer Ruben Ruiz right after the initial gunfire. Learning his wife, Eva Morales, a teacher, was shot and dying before his weapon was taken and he was removed for trying to engage the shooter, according to Texas DPS. The only teacher who did survive in those two rooms, Arnufel Reyes, shot twice, believes Morales could have been saved. If the law enforcement officers on scene would have allowed him to continue pursuing the gunman. Yeah, she would have probably lived. And I, I, I think she's one of the ones that they had said that also bled to death. All 11 of the students in his class didn't survive. Sam, it's stunning, it's shocking, and, and there's also disturbing information revealed about the gunman's past, his history online, what he was known as in that community, red flags galore. All of it is shocking. Savannah, you go back to years, to his childhood, where there are reports that he was facing bullying and social isolation, and that according to this report, Savannah, he moved over to social media platforms and gaming as a way to sort of grow his identity, find a refuge from that, but it took a darker and darker turn. We're talking about on platforms like YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, Ubo. He was known within the gaming community and within those social media platforms as the school shooter up to a year before the massacre. So the warning signs were there. The question is, 
is. Why weren't people saying something? Why wasn't someone intervening? That also, Savannah, we know he said to an acquaintance he was saving for something big. He asked two people to buy him firearms at the age of 17. It did not work out, and then he bought those guns when he turned 18 years old. We know what happened after that. Within, within days of his 18th birthday, Sam. Thank you very much. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle are here in New York City for a big event at the United Nations today. It is the couple's first public appearance since the Queen's Platinum Jubilee last month. NBC News Now anchor Joe Fryer is here with more. Hey, Joe. Hey there. Good morning. So Prince Harry will be a keynote speaker at the U.N. event celebrating Nelson Mandela International Day. Harry is expected to speak about how Mandela overcame obstacles in his life and how those lessons can help the world tackle issues like food insecurity and climate change. And Harry's appearance comes as anticipation builds over his upcoming memoir and another book, a bombshell book focusing on the Royal Rift. To honor Nelson Mandela's birthday during a celebration at the United Nations, today Prince Harry will address the UN General Assembly. His speech is expected to focus on the life and legacy of South Africa's first black leader. During their official tour of South Africa in 2019, Harry and Meghan spent time with Mandela's widow, Grassa Michelle. Prince Harry's admiration for the late human rights leader mirrors the respect shown by his mother, Princess Diana. The two met in Cape Town in 1997 to discuss the AIDS epidemic. Harry told Hoda recently that he feels his mother around him constantly. I feel her presence in almost everything that I do now, um, but definitely more so in the last two years than ever before, without question. So. She's, she's watching over us. I'm sure she's proud of you. <laughs> I'm sure she is. Today will be the first public outing for Harry and Meghan since the Queen's Platinum Jubilee last month. The pair kept a low profile, missing the iconic balcony appearance with the rest of the royal family at Buckingham Palace, but attending a church service. Their children, Lilibet and Archie, were said to have spent time with the Queen. It comes as speculation mounts about Prince Harry's upcoming memoir and what he'll reveal about the family. There will be some concern amongst the royal family that Harry's memoir might have more of those bombshell accusations that we saw come from the couple when they did their sit down with Oprah Winfrey. And there's another explosive new book detailing the Sussexes fallout with the other royals, according to insider interviews. In an exclusive excerpt published in the Sunday Times, author Tom Bauer details Harry and Meghan festering with fury over the Queen's Jubilee when the palace, quote, refused all of their demands for a prominent role. Bauer even writes Harry's presence at Prince Philip's funeral in April, quote, remained a problem, adding Harry and William were separated and the Queen was allegedly relieved Meghan was not in attendance. And as you might predict, the palace is declining to comment on all of this. We also reached out to the Sussexes as well. We have not yet they heard didn't, They didn't call you back? Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> they know how to reach me. <laughs> Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. This is a critical turn point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to spend some time with you. Appreciate it. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. It's a can't-miss summer on today. Bam! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. One of our favorites 
Shark Watch on today. I like it. Our focus this morning, the Great White. They've been called the king of the deep, and now they're surprising scientists in a whole new way. Yes, our resident shark expert is on the case. NBC senior national correspondent Carrie Sanders on the open waters this morning in search of sharks. Hi, Carrie. Well, good morning, and we have found sharks. We're more than six miles off the coast here. This is in federal waters, so we're allowed to chum the waters here. So if you take a look over my shoulder here, you can see the sharks that have gathered. These are silkies and sandbars. If we take a look from above, you can see that at some point there have been more than a dozen of the sharks surrounding our boat, but most impressive is to go underwater here and take a look at what we've seen here this morning with these sharks circling here. Now, as I noted, the great white occasionally is in this area and also in the Pacific. And what we discovered with some scientists from the Monterey Bay Aquarium is those juvenile great white sharks are on the move. We're with Monterey Bay Aquarium's director of collections, John O'Sullivan, on their research vessel. Two hour trip north in Monterey Bay to a spot just off Brighton State Beach when a spotter points. What do you say? Right there. Right here. This is exciting. Coming across juvenile great whites in the wild, so close to shore. This one, about nine feet in length. On this day, we come across four. So here's another juvenile white shark up at the surface, moving through this area. He's transiting pretty fast, probably twice the speed that we would normally be walking at. He's just below the surface. Together, we monitored a live image from a drone. This was something similar that we would see for years in Southern California, but now this is happening off uh, Monterey Bay. Unheard of a decade ago because the water here was just too cold, but in 2014, things changed. We had a heat wave, what they called the blob, and it was a very large warm water mass that came along the coast that raised the temperature from around 55 degrees up to almost 68. Using data from more than 20 years of tagging sharks in Southern California, researchers discovered a newly created warm water corridor that was inviting sharks to travel more than 200 miles away. What is it about the warm water that is a draw? Well, juvenile white sharks can't regulate their temperature like adults. Adults are big, they have a large girth and mass to their volume ratio so they can retain heat and which allows them to move into cold water. Juveniles don't have that yet. Great whites are considered one of the most aggressive species of sharks and have since engaged with humans in Monterey Bay. Two years ago, surfer Ben Kelly was killed by a great white and just four weeks ago, a suspected great white attacked 61 year old Steve Broomer as he was swimming. What are we to make of this? It was a very unfortunate event uh, for the victim, and our hearts go out to him and his family. Um, but this kind of illustrates the challenges with humans going into the water. The ocean can't at times be dangerous. Playing a key role in the research, these amazing videos that were taken by off-duty firefighter Eric Maylander. A shark enthusiast with his drone, Maylander once filmed as many as 30 different juvenile great whites in just a three quarter mile square zone. When you started to see juvenile great whites, what did you think? I thought it was cool. The, my favorite shark is my own backyard. So or one of the few places in the world, I should say, that you can see white sharks in their natural environment. So you're not baiting them in, you're not attracting them. They're just there. He kept unusually detailed notes with every flight, a stunning eight years worth, a treasure trove of citizen science data that he shared with researchers. It didn't take long to be convinced with the quality of video that no, these are juvenile white sharks. Earlier this year, the aquarium and their partners released their research, over 80 million data points from tagged sharks, like location, depth, and water temperature, so other scientists can learn more about the shark's movements. As ocean temperatures continue to climb, scientists wonder where might juvenile great whites show up next? So as we look at the sharks here, and again, these are silkies and sandbar sharks, the experts at Monterey Bay Aquarium say that the great whites moving into that area now further north 
do have impacts. Because they're juveniles, they're still learning to feed themselves, and they've been hitting on the sea otters, which are not on their diet, but they don't yet know that. So they're finding more injured and dead sea otters there. So you see how one impacts the next and impacts the next in that circle of life, guys. Indeed. Wow. We, we just hope you're tethered to the side of that boat, oh. Carrie. It's scary watching you right there. Before we <laughs> let you go, we do want to hear uh, about your story for tomorrow. It's off the coast of Carolina where you've done, uh, you dove in with researchers. You studied that famous shipwreck. Tell us about it. Yeah. <laughs> It, it's, it's a fascinating look at the sand tiger shark. Now, we're going to go down tomorrow to about 90, close to 100 feet on the Carib Sea. That's a World War II vessel that was sunk there. The reason we're going there is for the longest time, scientists believed that sand tigers gave birth close to shore. But, and you will find out tomorrow, there may be a wrinkle in that long-held theory, guys. Oh, uh, there's a tease. Thank you, Carrie. Be safe, Carrie. Uh -huh. uh, you, you've been with sharks. You've yeah. been swimming with sharks. Yeah, we've done a few shark dives. Uh, mm -hmm. Once in a cage, twice free, free range. Really? Free? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it, it, it's intense, but it's kind of cool. You know? wow. What kind of sharks? Uh, sand sharks, nurse sharks. You know, a couple of times. Those, those juvenile sharks are like middle schoolers. Like, yeah. They're, yeah. they're well, trying to figure out how to eat on their own. Yeah. Hormones. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Actually, yeah. how crazy. to do laundry. <laughs> They have to get carded. You know, it's, it's, it's crazy. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Ali Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Ali Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Yeah. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. We will meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Ali Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Ali Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. We are now back with another She Made It. It's a story about one woman taking a dive into the swimwear <laughs> industry. And, of course, Jill Martin is here to share it. Hey, Jilly, Jilly, Jilly. Jilly, 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 Jilly. Jilly. No, you've probably seen this, you said, all over your Instagram. Mm -hmm. and she's, oh, yeah. Yeah, she's been blowing up, and for good reason, because I spoke with Francesca Aiello. She's not even 30 yet, oh. but her brand is everywhere these days, and she's helping build body confidence, one trendy bikini at a time. Success doesn't have to be selling a million bathing suits. For me, success is being at a job that I love, that I'm so passionate about. 27-year-old Malibu native Francesca Aiello lives in bikinis. I would literally wake up and go to junior lifeguards, and the second my mom would pick me up, we would go to the beach and go surfing, and I would put my bikini on immediately. She launched her brand, Frankie's Bikinis, in 2012 after discovering a gap in the swimwear market. You love the water, but how did that lead into designing right. bathing suits? I remember seeing a woman on the beach and she was wearing a Brazilian cut bathing suit, but more importantly, her confidence. I was like, I have to get a bathing suit bottom like that, but I couldn't find them. With help from her mom turned business partner, 
Francesca went in search of these cheeky bikinis, finding the right fabrics and seamstresses to sew her designs. All my girlfriends would come and spend weekends with me as I was getting these tiny bottoms made for myself, and they wanted all my tiny bathing suits. Friends started to take interest in her custom-made suits, so she used social media to get her designs out there. This is like 2012. It was the wild, wild west of social media. I didn't know I was starting a company. and I think I knew that while I may not be able to beat our competitors in infrastructure or even sales, I could beat them in social following. All of her posting paid off and eventually caught the eye of a Victoria's Secret supermodel, Candace Swanepoel. So that first big moment was when Candace posted. She tagged us, which nowadays would cost so much money if you wanted something like that. And she reached out for suits. And um, my mom was like, who is this asking for free bathing suits? And I was like, mom, we have to send it to her immediately. And so we did and she posted about it and it just took off from there. As Frankie's grew, Francesca knew she needed something besides the cut and designs to set them apart. So she introduced capsule drops, constant small batches of new arrivals to keep customers interested. So who is the Frankie's girl? She is fun, daring, risk-taking for sure. When girls were opening their Frankie's packages in COVID, I wanted to make sure that they felt transported, like they were a part of this Southern California lifestyle in a way. They recently partnered with Gigi Hadid for a summer collection. And in March of this year, Victoria's Secret invested $18 million in Frankie's bikinis and will be selling their suits online. From my first meeting with their team, they were the first people that I, I talked to that were just as passionate about the growth of Frankie's as I am and as my mom is, and, and that was incredibly important to me. Francesca has sold hundreds of thousands of bathing suits to date and just opened her first brick and mortar store in New York City. It seems like you really want to motivate um, young women out there who are motivated by something that might not be the typical path. I think my advice is to just always follow your heart at the end of the day and do what's best for you. I wish I could go back and tell my younger self to be proud of doing something different. I admire that. Awesome story. Their suits come in extra small through extra, extra large. And what's fun about them is there are a lot of designs inspired by the 90s, yes, Y2K. The one in the middle is very 90s. I'm which, thinking that. Yeah, it's fun and trendy. And th the brand is so popular. This was the collaboration I spoke about with oh, Gigi Hadid. Funny. Sold out in three minutes. Three, three minutes. minutes. Oh, they should have made more. It's a, it, <laughs> they should have sure made more. That is yeah. really pretty. It's but, like a um, twall. But, but what? It's like a twall. Very I fresh. love that you knew that. It is a take on the toile, a current take on the toile. And she has very interesting prints and very different silhouettes for uh, whatever your desire is. You'd be so. such a good classroom teacher. You know, you'd have like the good kid like me, the one who speaks, you know, all over the place. A good student. Thank you, Jill. <laughs> Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. Defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.
This morning in today's checklist, we are helping you take charge of your health now and for years to come. So the pandemic forced so many of us to put off regular screenings, but that can cause even more medical issues as we get older. So here to help us get back on track is Dr. Kavita Agarwal, board certified in internal medicine. Dr. Agarwal, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. So first things first, you're not saying everyone should pick up the phone and make all your appointments for tomorrow, but summer's a good time to think ahead. It is absolutely the best time because sometimes doctors appointments can get booked up so if you start lining them up in the summer for the fall you'll be right on track okay and they're in your calendar ready to go yeah so the the first group of appointments we should make doesn't really involve any sort of particular age group but just in general appointments we should be making include what right so basically you want to get in with your primary care physician for your regular physical and there you'll be talking about a lot of things which we're going to go through today but for the general population that is your annual skin check that is your dental check that is your eye check and your physical as well okay good yeah. place to start yeah now. All right, my turn. Okay. All right, so let's drill down now. Let's start with some age groups. So let's okay. go to Gen Z's and millennials. So what, like maybe. Are you a millennial? Oh, no. Me? I'm older than you. I know. That's what I thought. I was just getting <laughs> Okay, sorry. moving on. Sorry. Okay, anyway. Okay. So these are for folks in 20s and 30s. You know, here's the thing about younger folks in this age group. You kind of feel like you're healthy and you don't really need to go to the doctor unless something's going on. At least that's the way I felt. I know. And you're absolutely right. You typically are very healthy in your 20s, but there's certain things you don't want to forget. Sure. So if you're in college or in school, you want that physical for your uh, school forms, for your sports forms. <laughs> um, women beginning in their 20s are actually going to begin cervical cancer really? screening. Really? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. It is every one to five years, depending on your risk factors. Okay. Um, and then, uh, in addition to cancer screenings, because again, in the age group, you really don't have as much cancers that you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. It's more about infection control. Mm -hmm. So one that I want to highlight is the HPV vaccine. That is the only anti-cancer vaccine that we have. People are still afraid of it. Oh, they shouldn't be. Aren't. They shouldn't be. It's been around for 20, 30 years. It's yeah. uh, proven to be safe. And we are really reducing the risk and the burden of HPV-related cancer. So important. So important. And then so the important. last one here. And the last one is the meningococcal vaccine. So again, if you're living in college in a dorm setting, if there's a meningitis outbreak, that can spread quite rapidly because it's airborne. So you want that vaccine every five years while you're in that That's risk important. setting. Okay, yeah, now I'm the guy who keeps walking in my camera. All right, okay. Sorry. Let's, go. Let's, get, let's get to Chanel's age group. Oh, boy. Uh, okay. folks, folks in their 40s and 50s. Okay, well, that's yeah, me too. Okay. Um, so when we come to this age group, we're now thinking more about cancer screenings. So in women, you're going to begin your breast cancer screenings between the age of 40 and 50 every one to two years. And that's regardless of family history? Well, if there's family history, it may be a little bit earlier. Okay. But for somebody at average risk, you're going to be between 40 and 50. Okay. Yep. Um, and then let's talk about colon cancer screening. There's been a shift, actually. Um, a couple years ago, it used to be beginning at the age of 50, and now we begin at the age of 45. Right. And that's, that's regardless of family history. Regardless yes. of family history. Men and women both. Absolutely. What about lung um, cancer Yeah, lung cancer screening. So there's been a shift with that, too, just recently. Now we recommend lung cancer screening for people age 50 to 80 hmm. who have ever smoked a pack a day for 20 years um, or recent quitters within the last 15 years. And that's with a low-dose CAT scan. It has much less radiation. If we can find it early, it's potentially curable. So if you've never smoked, you don't need the lung, lung cancer nope, screening? only okay. for people at risk. All right. Yep. Um, prostate cancer screening is for men, obviously, only, and that begins at the age of 55. And then last, we have the shingles vaccine, and that is for um, all persons over the age of 50. I don't know if you know, but shingles is a reactivation of chickenpox. Yeah. It's been dormant, and beginning age 50, it can reactivate. It's been living in your nerves, under yeah. your skin, and it can lead to nerve damage and chronic Scary. nerve pain. And if it happens by your eye or ear, it can actually affect your vision and hearing. My aunt had shingles. And it is terrible. It's miserable. Pain. Mr. Don't wish that on anybody. Uh, for those of us who are uh, in our golden years, golden in the years. 60s, okay. if you will. Yes. Uh, so uh, let's take a look at what we have. AFib. Yeah. So, you know, when we're in this age group, now we're kind of shifting to cardiovascular health. Mm -hmm. And AFib is an arrhythmia that's common in this age group. And screening begins at the age of 60 with a simple EKG. Very simple. What's AAA screening? So AAA is abdominal aortic aneurysm. And that screening is actually only for men beginning mm -hmm. age 65 if they've ever smoked even just 100 cigarettes in their lifetime or if they have a family history of such aneurysms. Then you do an ultrasound for that screening. And what about osteoporosis? Is that for everybody? That's for everybody, believe it or not. Bone health is very important. You've seen people with spinal fractures, hip fractures. Mm -hmm. Bones become brittle and start decaying, right. um, especially for women after menopause. You don't have the estrogen from the ovaries anymore. Mm -hmm. so I just got my pneumonia vaccine. Oh, yes. That's actually at the age of 65. Mm -hmm. And there's two new ones that just came um, uh, on the market. So Prevnar 15, Prevnar 20, in addition to the Pneumovax 23. So much to look forward to. Oh, my God. What about the flu vaccine for older <laughs> folks? Okay. So definitely, if you're over the age of 65, you want the high-dose flu shot.
Yeah, I learned a lot. Oh, I'm glad to help. Glad to help you so to be here today. Move into the doctor's office. When you're not just roaming the uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Kabita Argoal, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank really you for having me. I appreciate <laughs> it. Hope you'll join us tomorrow. Olympic mm. legend, Hall of Famer Lindsey Vaughn will be here with an exclusive announcement. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a great Monday. Here. Good job. You okay? Welcome to Dylan Dishes Cooking with Cal. In this Today All Day series, I'm looking back at some of my favorite Cooking with Cal recipes and sharing my top kitchen tips. Today's episode is one that we're calling Grandma's Greatest because it features recipes from two amazing grandmas. First up, you'll see me and Calvin whipping up my mom's pasta salad, and then we tackle my grandmother's short ribs. You know, one of the biggest obstacles timid cooks face in the kitchen is just not knowing where to start or what to make. Well, here's a good rule of thumb. Always cook what you know and what you loved growing up. Just think back to what your parents and grandparents always served. I've also found that family recipes are often the simplest, which is probably why our parents made them so often. This first recipe is proof of that. You only need five ingredients, pasta, canned tomatoes, black olives, parsley, and olive oil. Take a look. All right, so let's get the ingredients ready. I know this thing works. So we're gonna use a can of tomatoes. But these are cooked tomatoes. They're not raw tomatoes. So you'll like these because they're cooked tomatoes, okay? Now turn that as hard as you can. Use those muscles. Do you want some help? Do you know what these are? What? Olives. Black olives. On taste one, you haven't tried one in a long time. Ollie loves them. Ollie loves olives. A little bit. I love them. I could eat them like this. So we got our tomatoes, our olives. You know what this is? What? Got some parsley. All right, you want to chop this for me? Why don't you put your hand like that? There we go. Good job. Now I'm just gonna make these all a little smaller, okay? This adds a nice pop of green and a nice freshness to the whole dish. So a lot of times my mom would use elbow noodles, the ones that look like C's or U's as you call them. I felt like using tricolor pasta. You know why they call it tricolor pasta? Because there's three colors. So this one is just made with wheat. This one has tomato in it. And what do you think's in this one if it's green? That green. Close. What else is green? What's green and leafy? Celery. Well, celery has some leaves. What looks like lettuce? Spinach. Yay! Cool. I'm gonna dump this in, okay? Oh, well, that's boiling. Can you dump the can of tomatoes in here? Now all of the olives. The parsley. Ah, good call, buddy. Good idea. Now we wait. Can you taste that? Mm. Mm. Perfect. All right, drain the noodle. All right, I want to pour these into this bowl. Dump a whole bunch of olive oil in here. All of it? Not all of it, I'll tell you what. All around, swirl it all around. A little salt. This will come out fast, so let's not. Let's give it a big stir. Before we put this in the fridge to let it cool down, let's taste it, okay? Mm -hmm. You like it? it? Tastes even better when it's cold. So I thought this was such an easy recipe, but you guys had a lot of questions about it, so let's get to them. First, what's the last seasoning you put on this salad? Just salt and pepper. I think there's not a lot of seasoning or anything that goes into this salad, so if I sprinkle anything on it, it's, it's really just salt and pepper. I'm a big fan of salt and pepper. Next question, did you drain the tomatoes? Uh, no, I put the whole can with the diced tomatoes and the liquid because some of the pasta absorbs some of that liquid, so um, it, it helps to add some moisture to the dish. 
Another viewer asked, do you think it would still be tasty without the olives? Yes, the thing that's the best part about this recipe is this is just a base. If you don't like olives, if you don't like parsley, leave them out. If you want to put some cube cheese in there or some pepperoni, throw that in. Uh, really, it's just about a base. And if you like it a little tangier, you could probably throw in some Italian dressing. It's, it's just a basic, basic pasta salad. This is the way we always made it, but feel free to change it up however you want. Another question about olives, are they sliced black olives? Yes, I kept this recipe even simpler by buying the actual pre-sliced black olives, um, but you can buy regular olives and slice them up. I bet if you like it tangy, it would even taste good with green olives too. And another question about the tomatoes. What brand of tomatoes do you use? I'm not uh, that loyal to a particular brand, uh, but I do love San Marzano tomatoes whenever you can find them, whether you're using diced tomatoes or you're using you know, crushed tomatoes to make a sauce. San Marzano tomatoes are just a little bit sweeter, so you don't have to add the sugar to them, and they just, they're, they're straight from Italy, and they're just absolutely delicious. Slightly more expensive, but totally worth it, I promise. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to Dylan Dishes, Cooking with Cal. This episode is all about celebrating family recipes passed down from generation to generation. And Kelvin absolutely loves his grandma's recipe for pasta salad, and I absolutely love my grandma's recipe for short ribs. So my grandmother lived in an apartment that my dad built above our garage in our house. So it was always special when we kind of walked up the stairs to my grandmother's apartment for dinner. Her home was always warm, and cozy and it always just smelled so good. Whether it was, you know, beef and barley soup or these short ribs. I just remember it was always like a meat and potatoes or a hearty dish. And we'd all just sit around at her brown dining room table and it just, it was just special. We were still home, but we were over Graham's house eating one of her recipes and they were always so delicious. For this recipe, you'll need short ribs, paprika, chili powder, poultry seasoning, onion, tomato paste, egg noodles, peas, and salt and pepper. Say hi, Mammy. Hi, Mammy. Hi, Cal. How, How are you today? I asked you for the recipe, and you said, you know, you just throw the meat in a dish, you throw this together, you put it on top, you, you cover it for a little, you cook it for a little. There was no written instructions with the recipe, so a lot depended on looking at it, 
seeing what it's doing, throw it in the oven a little bit longer, that kind of thing. Well, I wish you could be here with me to help make this and, and especially eat it with us. It'll be a tight squeeze, but we'll see if we can get them all here. Okay. There we go. They're all squeezed in there, right? Yeah. More okay. right. salt, pepper. Now we have to slice up an onion. Oh, what if it hurts my eye? I know. Can I close my eye? Well, then it's hard to cut and close your eyes at the same time. Okay. I'm gonna make some slices here. Good job. You okay? <laughs> We've got all kinds of spices here, okay? Are we gonna mix them up? Yeah, but first. I want you to scoop all of this tomato paste into here as well, okay? okay. You pour this water in there. I cannot do it. Because you're here to help me. Okay, so now we're going to pour all of this all over our short ribs. Now we're going to bake them. Then we're gonna bake them, you're right. So all we have to do, we're gonna cover this with foil. We're gonna bake it for like 45 minutes. 45 minutes, I have soccer, right? <laughs> That's right. Put it back in the oven without the foil so it finishes cooking. Where's the This tastes exactly like my grandma's. Is hers yummy? Hers is so yummy. One of the questions I get asked all the time is what are the tools you use with Calvin in the kitchen? And knives are the big question because I'm cooking with a kid and here he is chopping some vegetables. So when I first started cooking with Calvin, I did all the chopping. I didn't want him anywhere near a knife. He did the stirring, he did the breaking of the eggs, he did all that. Then once he wanted to participate more, I found these knives. Um, they're plastic knives, you can find them anywhere online. So they're, they're sharp enough to cut, but they're not really sharp enough that Calvin would cut his finger. <laughs> so the best vegetables this works for are something like zucchini, something like cooked potatoes, uh, hard boiled egg would be good, soft fruits like berries or pears. And you know, it takes, it takes a little, little bit of strength, but at least it, you know, is not going to hurt them. And it kind of just gets them used to, you know, some knife skills. I would also, you know, kind of do this for Calvin. I'd chop this up with my knife and then just give him a little bit to just sort of learn how to rock the knife, learn how to keep his hands out of the way, and just really basic knife skills with, with soft fruits and vegetables. That's what these knives are good for. Eventually, it became a thing though where you know, you're making soup and you're chopping some harder stuff like carrots and onions. So I needed to upgrade a little bit and I found these great knives. This is an actual knife. I mean, it's, it's sharp and it will cut through your hard vegetables. But the thing I love about it is it also comes with this shield. So it teaches you the proper way to cut. So Calvin can put his hand here and he learns, you know, you stick your finger through this hole, so he learns you know, not to put his finger under here, so his hand placement is good on the knife. And then he learns to kind of rock, but look at how this is like a real sharp knife for a kid. But it's all safe. The hand that's holding the knife knows how to hold it properly. The hand that's holding the food knows how to hold it properly so that your fingers are kept out of the way. The thing I love about this brand is that it also comes with a peeler. Calvin loves apples and pears. Obviously he loves carrots, but he does not like the skin on anything. He'd peel a blueberry if he could. So the same kind of thing. You stick your finger in the hole and then it teaches you to just have your fingers out of the way. So my job is to make sure he holds, you know, the right end and isn't like, you know, doing it the wrong way. 
And this thing's role is to make sure Calvin holds this the right way. So you can see how sharp they are, they work. So once your kid masters the plastic knife, I think it's good to upgrade to the real deal. The next time you go to your parents or your grandparents' house, look through their recipe boxes. You may just find some delicious gems that you totally forgot about. But until then, I hope you'll try my family recipes and let me know what you think. For all these recipes, go to today.com slash Dylan Dishes. So first, what you're going to need is breadcrumbs, Italian seasoning, olive oil, and serrated <laughs> mozzarella cheese. <laughs> My name is Peyton Janicki, and this is Kids in the Kitchen. I'm Peyton Janicki, I'm eight years old, and I'm in third grade. My earliest memory of cooking is when I was younger, I used to help my grandma make apple and pumpkin pies for Thanksgiving. I love cooking with my grandma because she's very nice and she's also a really good cook, and at the end I get to eat it. <laughs> we need to add some chicken broth um, with a pot of oil in it, um, and you need to let that sit before we add the couscous. My favorite thing about having my YouTube channel, Practically Peyton, it's basically just cooking and just like, it's not even, it's not even hard for me. It's, it's really fun. I love to cook for my mom, my dad, and my little brother, Michael. I also bake for my dog sometimes. For his first birthday, I helped bake him a cake. And it was basically just dog food, but shaped into like a bone shape. And it also came with some icing for dogs. He loved it so much. Some of my favorite hobbies are softball, swimming, dance, basketball, singing, and piano. When I grow up, there's three things that I might want to be. I want to be a teacher, a chef, and an art teacher because I love to do art. I think that cooking is basically kind of like art. I might put in the wrong ingredient and I still want to see how it turns out. It's basically like mixing paint colors. Today I'm so excited because I get to show you how to make Nanny's stuffed chicken breast and roasted broccoli. A couple of years ago, my nanny's created this recipe because she was really good at making chicken cutlets and she knew one of my favorite foods was pepperoni. So she magically put the pepperoni in the chicken cutlets and it was amazing. Okay guys, let's get started. I'm so excited. Make sure you preheat the oven to 425 degrees. First thing is we are going to line this cookie sheet with foil and then we're gonna spray it with some non-stick baking spray. I love using foil because it makes cleanup super easy. The first ingredients that you're gonna need is breadcrumbs, Italian seasoning, olive oil, and shredded mozzarella cheese. I like using shredded mozzarella cheese because you don't have to shred it. And it's just like so hard shredding it and you can get hurt shredding it. In a small bowl, I'm going to add breadcrumbs, Italian seasoning, olive oil, and mozzarella cheese. This is my topping. The cheese and the olive oil are going to make the chicken brown, crispy, and delicious. So now you're gonna grab your thin chicken breast, salt, pepper, mozzarella cheese, pepperoni, and sour cream. The thinner the chicken breast, the better, because we're kind of making a pepperoni sandwich. And the bun is the chicken. Place half of the chicken breast on the prepared foil. Now 
Now we're going to season it with salt and pepper. This is like sprinkling fairy dust. Now we're going to sprinkle it with a half a cup of shredded mozzarella cheese. You want to make sure you spread it evenly throughout the four chicken breasts. You don't want to skip out on the cheese. My brother loves cheese, so I think I'm going to give him a little bit extra. He'll thank me later. My favorite step of this whole thing, adding the pepperoni. So you want to add three pieces of pepperoni on each slice, each piece of chicken. What I love most about pepperoni is probably like it has like a little spice to it. It has like a little hotness. I love pepperoni so much. I even eat it for breakfast sometimes. And secretly I try to sneak it into all of my recipes. Now we're gonna place the other half of the chicken on top of all of these pieces of chicken. Now we're going to put a thin layer of sour cream onto the chicken. This has a really good flavor, it, and it also helps make the breadcrumbs stick to the chicken. It's kind of like frosting in a cake. Now we are going to put the breadcrumb mixture on top of the chicken. I like this breadcrumb mixture because it makes the chicken like nice and crispy, and it gives a different but good flavor. See, this is the magic of the sour cream because it's sticking perfectly. This is looking so good, I can't wait to eat it. Now it's time to put this in the oven. It looks great, but I can't do it since I'm a kid, so I need help from my dad. Dad! Now we're gonna bake that for 20 minutes, and in the meantime, I'm going to bake one of my most favorite side dishes, roasted broccoli. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back to you today. We got a lot to celebrate on yes. this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Are you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. 
We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. It's a can't miss summer on today. They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. Fun fact, it is actually like when you get any vegetable and put salt, pepper, olive oil, and garlic powder like on top of it and bake it, it'll taste amazing. I actually won't eat broccoli any other way. I always bake it this way and I love it. Now the first thing we're gonna do is cut the broccoli into florets, but you can also just pull them apart and then you can have a parent cut it a little bit more after. Now that we're getting to the middle, I'm just gonna leave this for mom. Mom, can you come help me? Let's cut the broccoli. Make sure they're at a similar size so they roast evenly. Well, you're a fast cutter. Now, you're gonna add olive oil. Salt. Pepper. And garlic powder. Now you wanna mix this really well. And cooking can get messy, so Do it with your hands. It feels like, I don't know, like, have you ever like felt foam beads for like slime? It feels like that, but like wet and a little bit like more like crunchy. You wanna make sure they're in one row or layer because if it's not, it'll just steam instead of getting all like crispy and delicious. It's time to put this baby in the oven, but I need help. Dad? Now we have to wait 10 minutes. It's starting to smell so good, so that's a good sign. I'm getting super hungry too. Look at how amazing this looks. It looks so delicious. The chicken, it looks so crispy and good, and the broccoli, it look, the same. It, it looks very crispy and good. It just, I imagine it in my mouth. Tasting so good. All right, let's plate it. I'm gonna play another one because I have a special guest. I can't wait until she arrives. She's gonna love this meal. Oh my gosh, perfect timing, she's here. you were sniffing when you just came in. Oh, I can't wait to eat it. Thank you so, thank you so much. You're welcome. You did a great job. Mm. You make this exactly like I did. Okay, let's Actually, see how it tastes. Yours, I think, tastes even better. <laughs> it's so delicious. I love sharing meals with you. Anytime. <laughs> even if it's not this dish. <laughs> I love you so much. 
I love you too. I loved having you guys in the kitchen today. I hope you'll keep this recipe in mind and share it with someone special too. Bye! new report overnight blasting the response in Uvalde from top to bottom. 